Who's a ghostwriter? I was like, Are you serious? She's like, Yeah. She's like, I'll, I'll connect y'all. I immediately hit her up, Leah Lakins, and I said, Jan, all right, we ready. And and it was just in the in the thesis of the book, I've been talking about 
I've been writing it in columns. I've been talking about it on television. I've been talking about it on radio, but the book process was different. And so, and so I called Leah. I said, Leah, listen, I do not have time to literally sit down and write this. Hmm. So what I'm going to do is I will do a complete brain dump. And so we probably had 10, 15 conversations where I would just talk. And so I actually, and, and I give, and pe- what people don't understand is, uh, I speak all around the country, all around the world. I don't write speeches. I've only written two speeches in my life. I never read it from them. I was like, well, that was a waste of my damn time. Yeah, can I ask you, just because that would, that is a revelation, I'm sure, to many people who are watching right now. Um, I think about the great jazz musicians and how they didn't <laughs> compose every note. They would lay out right. the charts, and then every the night, they say, Sonny about? Rollins, you go see him five nights in a row. It's going to be five different concerts. Yes. And when you hear you speak, it is well organized. It's laid out. You have the theses, the punctuation points. But you're saying, that is where does that come from, then, if you're not writing it down, Ro? There's no, like, okay, when I say... When I say I don't write it down, there is no outline. Mm-hmm. Oh, you don't there even no, have a chart in your mind. You no, have- no, no, no. There are no notes. There's, there are no, there's, there's the, like literally none of that. If this was rap, it's, it's, it's completely freestyle. There literally is no, uh, there, there's none of that. And so, the fuck is he talking um, about? What I do. I suspect that Leah Lakins did a substantial amount of work, but this book is in your voice and it is organized. Yeah the logic that you speak so i don't know how much work that, she had to that do. right that that's that's how it was done so literally yeah. literally that's why it was funny when i when i had to do the when i had to do the audible version what is we doing? i people people said oh my god i love listening to the audible version because i'm hearing you and i was like yeah because <laughs> i i read it like i speak yes. which is how how she put it together and and so for me it was literally here's the thought and I would just unfold it, and then she He's would ask a question, shit. and I would unroll it, and then she would ask a question, and then and I would just talk, and sometimes I would just talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes, uh, and, and again, what people don't understand, you know, I've done our 90-minute lectures, and it's, it's no notes, it's no, it's no reference points, it's none of that. You're, you will rarely ever see me, like, pull my phone out, and if I, if I read something and, and I'm quoting it, it's because I literally just saw it. There's a woman I know who is a ghostwriter. I was like, are you serious? She's like, yeah. She's like, I'll, I'll connect y'all. I immediately hit her up, Leah Lakins, and I said, Jan, all right, we ready. And and it was just, and, 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 the, and the thesis of the book, I've been... Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You can play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh my goodness, let's see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you, but what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I, I, mix, I, like, what I, I mix, like, what I, I like, mix, what I, I like, mix, what I, I mix, like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at BPM. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. 
Oh man, greetings to everybody who's here live. Shout out to the remixers and to those who will see this and and, and hear this later. Peace to you as well. <laughs> Oh man, I'm sorry. I, you know, what can I say? Hey, but in all seriousness, uh, to, to, for any of us who have particularly who had, had, uh, followed the work of, of Dr. Carr for so long, um, that's just, that's hard to watch. That's hard to watch. Uh, to have literally, well, I guess not literally sat at his feet, but to, to, to have, to have traveled many hours and miles to see him speak back in the pre online days, et cetera. Um, and to hear him talk eloquently and, and with, 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 uh, great, uh, dexterity and memory about, his love of uh, of being a bibliophile. He probably is the one that introduced me to that term. D to hear and the way he would discuss finding all of these great works. To hear him talk with 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 Roland uh, in that way about that book. That was difficult. That was difficult. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, you know, I'm laughing and joking or whatever, but anyway, so, uh, but, you know, the humor is still there. The humor is still there. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to be talking with uh, um, Devin Springer and Erica Keynes uh, about the recently uh, published piece by Erica in Hood Communist uh, about what to me is a parallel hashtag activism, the, the sort of emptiness, the symbolic emptiness of, of rhetoric uh, or the empty, the political emptiness of symbolism and rhetoric. Um, so, uh, I look forward to, to, to them showing up and Dev had sent some, um, uh, some, some hip hop for, for us to check out. I got to hear some of it. Uh, and, and as I'll, I'll share with them when, when they, when they get here, I think I'm just too old. It's not even about the content per se. It's the, the, the aesthetic, the sound. It's not, it's not for me. And then there is just a part of it that I feel like at this day, at this point, <clears throat> I don't really want to hear regardless in this area, I am, uh, uh, fully equal. Uh, I don't want to hear any, any, any young people talking about their sex lives at this point. I think I'm good on all of that. So, um, but so that's that's a barrier for me to and I struggle with that with my students too. But um yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Um and that's what I'm saying. I mean, and that was the whole and 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 if you go back and I which I think is an evergreen video at this point, the the the, the debate uh Kalanji hosted between me and Dr. Carr. Um that's sort of my point the whole the whole time. It, it's not it's not that it's not even my my point that that really in that that exchange wasn't even to 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 have a back and forth with him on the issues. It was really to just make the point that for lack of a better way of putting it, like I know you know better. Like I know you can do better. You have so much more to offer. Um, and this whole thing of, of trying to narrow a message for a broader audience, just, just, uh, it, it, it makes the message useless, I think. So that's why I am, uh, you know, all respect and rest in peace to Glenn Ford. I've always appreciated his black agenda report approach. 
he was always very clear. I'm not trying to reach the masses. So people would always come to him with well, you too hard. You too this. You can't reach a broader audience. He's like, that's not what that wasn't the point. Black Agenda Report was targeting a specific, as 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 he would have put it in one way or another, an intelligentsia of activists, of 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 certain educators, journalists, to to help organize their work and analyses or impact their work and like that to me. So I always was looking forward to Carr playing that kind of role. But here, this is, that's not, you know, that's not, that's not it. And speaking of this, it, it, it yeah, word up to Glenn Ford, but speaking of this, like, like, like just a quick switch of context here, but my man R.M. Brown, Somebody reach out to, to that dude quickly before I have to lose yet another. <laughs> the, the, the liberal left is reaching out for him. He is getting big time. And I've seen him pop up on, on Majority Report. I've seen him pop up and he did a, he did a live stream with Anna Kasparian or whatever her name is. Like, dude, you're supposed to be to the left of them making fun of them as much as you are the right. Oh. But I get it. If this is your, I get it. I get it. If this is your primary and for them, it must be at this point, the way they produce. If, if YouTube is your primary, if this is your primary outlet and, and, and I don't know what Dr. Carr's salary is in terms of Howard, but what I what I can expect of HBCUs is 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 it's not what it's it's not what it's supposed to be. So he might be thinking the same thing, you know, in a, in another way that that the more this space becomes your bread and butter, I get it. I mean, I've seen on this side, the analytics as BPM grows a little bit. I see what it could be if you start to extrapolate the numbers and make it about one person and and like extrapolate and start adding zeros. You're like, wow. OK. OK. I see why I can I can literally see why people start saying, well, maybe I'll stop being critical of the Democrats so much. It, it, you know, and uh, anyway, so uh, anyway, somebody get a note to my man, R.M. Brown, slow down. He used to self-refer as a communist and drop little like in his jokes, like do that lane, his, you know, play that lane, stay in that lane. I, I couldn't even watch. I was like, I'm not why you supposed to be making fun of Anna Kasparian and, and, and the young Turks and all of them. And, and, and. And to an extent, Sam Cedar and all of them, uh, who keep telling everybody that they have to stop. They they can only they're really their only outlet is to vote for the Pelosi's and the whoever's. Nah, man. Mm, mm, mm. I hear you, and I watch Majority Report. I don't mind watching. And my point, I can't watch the Young Turks though. So I hear you on that. I watch majority report. I'm not, I'm just saying like, like, I don't want that to be, but I want him to have a, 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 I don't want him to be with them is my point. I wanted, I, I wanted him to be, to, to remain outside of that space and to hopefully be able to throw some, some, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I hear you though. I hear you. I hear you, Coco. I hear you. I hear. I hear you. I hear you. And I remember when the late great Dr. Ron Walters was on my my dissertation committee in grad school and got me my first book chapter publication. And he was very honest about where he was publicly and politically and all of that. He was a good dude. Always respect Dr. Walters. But I remember that one time he invited us over to his house. Uh, uh, not too far from where I live in Maryland. 
But I remember vividly, I was like, I've driven by this area for years and had no idea this neighborhood even existed. Never even saw it. Took a right when I might have normally gone straight or turned left and was in this whole other world. And with and 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 walking around his house, I was like, it was one of those moments where I was like, I get it, I get it. I see, I see, it's a very, <laughs> woo, it's, 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 it's other worlds out here. Anyway. <laughs> All right, good people, enough of that nonsense. It's time to get serious. Uh, our, uh, our guests are arriving, so let's get serious. <clears throat> woo. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I see. I see why. Maybe I'm not about this life, Coco, walking around Dr. Walter's house. I was like, good, goop, goobly goop. Shout out to Grady. Anyway, back into the second. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, everybody? Ricky Ryan, Erica Cades in the building. Black Alliance for Peace, hood communist, author, activist. Who don't you work with that's on the, the Black liberationist left? What's up? How you doing this morning? Peace, peace. How are you this morning? Oh, I'm as good as could be expected. Let me just... Um, well, wow, I'll pull it up my notes because unlike Roland Martin, I yeah, need to... <laughs> you said what? What'd you say? I'm pulling out my notes because unlike Roland Martin, I need an outline. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he said they went from jazz and Coltrane to 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 I don't I, I don't write my lyrics like Biggie and Jay Z. To to I give speeches. Yeah, and I saw those speeches. I wouldn't write anything down for that either. But maybe you just like that, Roland. Maybe you just like that. But 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 anyway, that was that was rough. No, but you write you 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 do write articles and essays, um, which which should be uh, uh, bars and notes for others who want to do uh, and 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 create serious work and analysis. And you've done so yet again. Uh, and I appreciate you uh, uh, inviting us to host and discuss this on the show here. Um, so I will, and I'm waiting for the thing to, where are my notes not showing up on there anyway? Uh, so let me pull the article up. The the, the uh, link is already in the show description. Hashtag activism in U.S. imperialism, imperialism uh, from October 13th in, in uh, Hood Communist. Uh, the, the caption here reads, a protester wears glasses with a hashtag being used to protest the death of Masha Amini at a rally in support of the people of Iran and against the Iranian government at Civic Center Plaza in San Francisco. And the first thing, of course, is how can you be mad at a picture like this, Erica? I'm a hater, but how can you be mad at that? That's stylish, is fly, is put in front and center. The message of the day, it's in defense of a, of, of a woman treated brutally by an oppressive regime. What What's up? Like, why would you even start with even targeting this right here? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think um, I think the picture was used and the woman like freedom was used because that's the current hashtag. Um, so I just want to center the way that um, these things can kind of take off and have a life of their own um, that's maybe not rooted in anything that's happening on the ground or any particular protest, but um, attempting to uh, create their own sort of narrative around protesting. And what I note in the piece is that the use of hashtag activism um, while it's it's certainly replaced uh, in-person community organizing because uh, it allows a array of people um, across the country and around the world to sort of be united in solidarity for whatever cause that could be summarized in uh, small 
character limit as possible. Like I know before when Twitter was like a hundred and something words, now it's 200 and something words. If you can get your statements out in just those brief passages, um, you're allegedly doing more than door to door organizing. So um, this connection um, is oftentimes heralded as one of the more positive things about social media. So like all the things that's happening with Elon Musk and Twitter right now, there are there are Africans online that's arguing, don't leave Twitter. We need that space. We built that space. Um, look at all the things that have happened through Twitter. And they would name all of these instances of hashtag activism, um, which I think it's funny, ironic, um, I guess. But I think the more the the what what I'm trying to express in the piece is that um, without any grounded material analysis, um, similar to what I wrote about lived experience, um, similar to what I wrote about with all states that all states are bad, it's that people, for the sake of um, activism or organizing or showing solidarity, sort of don't investigate a damn thing. <laughs> they don't look into mm. anything. Um, they wait for the hashtag. They wait for a particular narrative um, that suits them. Like if they already have something in their mind about an area, then if this narrative sort of uh, confirms that, then they'll take on and they'll run with it. Um, they look for bias confirmation. So they'll find the articles that support their bias, um, but they don't investigate who runs that paper. Who is the um, journalist that's writing that paper? What are the politics of the paper? Like the, people are not really investigating, um, but they're seeing hashtags and they're engaging in hashtags um, as a form of activism. And that just become the norm to the point where, um, as you can see, that is the first step in people sort of gallivanting around a cause is to get online, create a hashtag and spread it. You talk about, uh, uh, you use the phrase weaponized empathy, um, which which I think even in that, that I mean, that's to me what I see when I see these pictures that you, you highlight here, even, regardless of the well-meaning intention of the people involved. Um, because this, you know, to, to any any half decent human being who sees this picture, it's going to be, it's hard to be, you know, it's hard to be openly critical of some of, of, of that. Right. And uh, on, yeah. um, on the on her communists only wrote an incredible piece um, around the time of the the proxy war in Ukraine was while all that was kicking off. She wrote a piece about the weaponization of empathy, um, which I sort of drew from because you can see that play out like that is really the purpose. There's particular images that are used. There's particular slogans that are used. Um, I mean, the women like freedom. How could you disagree? <laughs> Are you disagreeing with women, life, and freedom? Um, right, so it's, right. It's, it's, yeah. Um, so it doesn't really call for folks to say, wait, what a minute, what's really happening? Because you're seeing a certain thing happening. Uh, we see that play out in Cuba. We've seen that play out in Nicaragua in 2018 and Venezuela in 2019. Um, we've seen that with Tigray. That was a mm. real big thing with Tigray, that weaponization of empathy. Mm. And um, all of these things are being found after the fact, after we done took off running with the hashtag, <laughs> um, to not be true at all, to have um, soft power influences like NET or USAID. Um, so it doesn't necessarily always have to be like when we talk about uh, US imperialism and the covert or overt um, actions of US imperialism, I think people are instantly thinking military, right? Um, and even in the case of Iran, Iran is surrounded by 40 military bases on all sides, <laughs> on all sides. Um, but a lot of what's happening, too, is that we see that on those borders of where those 40 um, military bases that are surrounding Iran are, our NED, our USAID, are like those funded um, back things that's happening. So I, when people sort of dismiss uh, tankies, <laughs> because they, they, there's this idea that um, we all think that everything the U.S. does is bad and nobody else is capable of doing anything bad. But I think that that's just like not the perspective to have. We're talking about a country that has over 800 military bases worldwide, that has carved up the entire world into military bases, in, into military commands, including space. So there's 11 military commands. There's AFRICOM, the Indo-Pacific is the largest, SOUTHCOM is the oldest. Um, Central Command. I mean, they even have one for North America. So there's, there's, uh, there's so many commands. And that's 
the, the U.S. has so much leniency in the in the U.N. They really get they, there's no accountability for the U.S. the U.S. and the U.N. Um, they they're making all of these uh, strategic partnerships, uh, military strategic partnerships. There are the, the U.S.D. is the primary source <laughs> of funding and income. Like the U.S. can freeze Nicaragua. I mean Venezuela's gold. They can you know never pay Afghanistan back. They can give Afghanistan's money to 9-11 victims and never have to. So when we talk about the U.S., we really have to really think about the U.S. as an overreaching and overarching empire. And when people talk about like these other areas, I don't. I think that they're doing these one-to-one -one comparisons because all they understand really, especially when you live in empire and you have no real um, understanding of other places. Like you've never been to China, you never researched China. I mean, people talk about these countries like it's just one flat country. They don't have states, they don't have a governance, they don't have like you know, there's no mayors. It's just the leader running everything. Uh, people can tell you two names, two two towns in, in Iran. People like you know outside of the capital. The same with China. The two. Like <laughs> they can name um, outside of the capital, but they know. They know for sure that these are organic, on the ground, um, youth-led, woman-led, like those type of things. I think two is way too generous. Mo most people, if they think of Iran at all, they think of of the enemies in in three hundred in in films like that. That's right. who they think. You know, if they if they you know that's that's who they're thinking of. Two right. towns. Eric, was <laughs> polite <laughs> this morning. They can't even, <laughs> they can't even name. name anything outside of what's being told to them uh, because there's not any real need to investigate. Like, um, for instance, I, I even did note. So the Hajib thing has been a thing. It's not like this is mm. something that, that sparked because of what happened to this young woman. Mm -hmm. But also, there's particular players that are obviously going to move in and take advantage of this. And one of the people who have been um, sort of, uh, I guess, credited for internationalizing the hashtag and drawing, uh, drawing a lot of attention to it is this woman. Um, I never remember her name because I, I like roll my eyes. She's on MSNBC all the time now. Uh, but I write about her in the article. I name her specifically. But she's been calling for sanctions in Iran for years, um, at least the last six. She's in pictures with Mike Pompeo. Mm. She's hobnobbing with Trump during the COVID. She's asking for harsher sanctions, insisting that they are just putting on, that people are dying so that they can get sympathy for the, so the, the authoritarian, authoritarian dictatorship can gain some sympathy during COVID, but they need more sanctions. Keep in mind, Iran is probably I mean, next to Cuba, Iran has been sanctioned, has had sanctions on it since the revolution. So since, then, so it's like over 40 years of sanctions. Um, every 10 years, these sort of incidents that we see, um, where's, oh, there's a new revolution in Iran that kind of always takes off <laughs> every so often, which is why I always encourage people to investigate because uh, we don't know, like all, all protests and all actions are class-based. There are no actions that are not class-based. And we need to understand what is the driving class, what is the driving force behind this. So yeah, people can have legitimate criticisms and legitimate angst, but what is the driving force behind these riots, um, the burning of the mosque, the mm. killing of civilians, the killing of police officers? Is that about this woman? Um, but but before, because I know I jumped ahead really to like. No, it's cool. <laughs> at the end of the it's paper, cool. I, I list current examples in Iran. Of course, it's mm -hmm. one of them. I talk about Cuba for a little bit, but I do also want to note Hong Kong and Bolivia. We've seen these things happen um, with hashtag movements. But two of the, what drew me to this, honestly, was watching it play out. And a lot of what I was seeing was really sort of celebrity driven. Like, there were all these white women celebrities that all of a sudden cared about Iranian women, which obviously was riddled in Islamophobia. Um, you know, that's not a secret. That's not. <laughs> but they they all showed up in mass. Everybody was shaving their hair. Um, and it really took me back to bring back our girls. Mm. 
and that's really what I open the piece with as an example, hashtag bring back our girls, because people see these hashtags and then never really investigate, well, what the hell happened to that? Like, were the girls brought back? <laughs> Whatever happened to that? Um, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. The, the the reason I first years ago looked into that hashtag was because somebody, a, a colleague on campus, not at all known for any radicalism or politics, came came to a meeting one day, you know, in a huff, like, we got to get on this hashtag. We got to, you know, support this. And, 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 and I was like, wait a minute. So I, I was so that 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 just made me start to look into what you know in that instance what you're talking about here you know why are you all of a sudden finding this acceptable to 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 dive into and wrap yourself around as as a um uh and a lot of it is this connected to what you said about uh uh um uh, elsewhere, the the Islamophobia piece and the, right. the it makes we sense, can just jump right, right on up. It it makes it easy. Now right. we can yeah, all. Why wouldn't there be Islamic terrorists kidnapping little black girls in Africa? Like it sounds reasonable, isn't that what always happens in Africa? Isn't that why Africom is there? So like <laughs> they even had to start wow. Black Panther with that. Yeah, the first <laughs> one they had so, to start off with a scene doing that. <laughs> Um, so, it, okay, so it was a big to-do, that hashtag. We've seen celebrities from Chris Brown, who's, I mean, obviously politically active. Hey, um, radical goodbye. spokesperson hey, leader that extraordinaire. That song. We've seen Michelle Obama, which was, of course, is the more famous um, example of it everywhere. But the pictures and images that, that um, celebrities were using was this one, this picture of a little black girl with a lone tear in black and white. That little black girl, the tear, the picture was stolen, first of all. Mm. <laughs> there was no tear. If you see the mm. picture in color, I wish I would have thought about, thought ahead to um, bring that up. But there is no tear. And that girl is from um, Giddy Basal. So that oh, was a little wow. girl in her school in Giddy Basal that in that picture was taken by a white photographer. They um, imposed the one teardrop and they uh, made it black and white for that weaponization of empathy and then it became the bring back our girls so if you ever see that image it's the one real image that's tied to it um but that image has nothing yeah, to do to with that area it. has nothing to do with what was happening to those girls um at all but they were able to use that and that shit spread like like wildfire because obviously who's not going to care about what's happening with little black girls and at the time you know the whole the newfound was it this one here on Twitter, <laughs> where um, you know everybody this... was discussing intersectionality and 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 you know gender wars was was taking off. Um, it became a real big thing to protect black girls, black women. Um, mm -hmm. and that hashtag was sort of used as a way, as a means to do, like you know, to sort of gallivant behind that. There it is, the bring back our girls with that. She has her mm -hmm. head down. This one, yeah, which where, she, where she's like has her head down on the desk. This one here, yes. yeah, that's it. <clears throat> yeah, that tear is fake. <laughs> there is no tear. Um, you can probably find the original picture. Um, that's not in black and white, and she was looking out of her classroom window when that picture was taken in Guinea Bissau. That is not a Nigerian <laughs> girl. She's never been to Nigeria. Um, and none of what was happening um, in Nigeria concerned that girl, but she was became the poster in the face of "Bring Back Our Girls." But let's talk about because we talked about the, um, you know, the the big hashtag active movement. But let's talk about what happened in the after effect because mm -hmm. what what it did result in is the support for further intervention from U.S. puppet states. Um, so. Nigeria sort of masked the reality that U.S. imperialism was actually always kind of there. <laughs> um, U.S. military was there uh, protecting corporate theft of the country's wealth from the Nigerian people, uh, particularly or primarily the Shell Corporation. So by then, by the time um, Bring Back Our Girls had started, AFRICOM was already vastly increasing. Because you remember AFRICOM started in 2007 and has expanded drastically um, during the Obama years, which 
uh, make note of that because there's another hashtag I want to talk about that also happened under the Obama years. Um, but by then, you know, AFRICOM, it, it vastly increased its presence on the continent with the use of drone surveillance and weapons distribution and training of security uh, forces, including the forces that were protecting the, um, the Niger Delta region. Which, What's where, up, Dev? Um, Sorry to interrupt you, Erica. Just welcoming Dev to the to the to the show. Good morning, right everybody. Right. Dev Springer, <laughs> grounding hey. podcast journalist, activist, documentarian, remixer. Oh. Um, <laughs> what's up everybody how y'all doing um i feel like the pettiness which was displayed at the opening <laughs> i was not prepared i um it, you know i listen erica knows this i listen to the morning show like a podcast in the background while i work in the morning and uh i had to stop what i was doing and look at the screen for a second because <laughs> It was just some general shadiness going on, and I'm I'm a huge fan of all forms of shadiness. So, a shout out, right. to y'all. <laughs> right. shout out to y'all. Your man said right on, right on. That's what really threw me. He don't write. He don't write straight from the dome. No. He, 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 hey, y'all gonna be real surprised to ever learn my writing process, but I don't think you'll ever be able to go into any note of mine or find an outline. I will say that. I ain't never had no ghostwriter though. I've been y'all, y'all. This ain't even the conversation. I'm getting off topic, but y'all yeah. know uh, when I write my tell-all memoir, I'll let y'all know some of the activists who've asked me to ghostwrite for them before. <laughs> um, oh, that, that. there's oh, a whole yeah. it's a whole industry of big activists who need little activists and organizers to actually write for them because they actually do the work, and so. You know that, and oh, and please have a section for. There's got to be a version of that where where the big platform uh, uh, podcasts have their little satellites that they refer to mm -hmm. and borrow from, but don't cite source or invite to their platform. Of but course. it'd be a whole bunch of behind the scenes, like oh, <laughs> oh, let me let me borrow this and get help from you from that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. my bad. When I when Dr. Burroughs ghost writes my memoir, <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna know, be my chapter. Yeah. And look, let me just say this because you know I signed NDAs, so I'm I'm not going to jail or paying no fine no time soon. But <laughs> it's not just the Democrat left liberal centrist activists who oh, are no out question. here with ghost writers. It is, um, it's acad left quote unquote academics, celebrity organizers, so-called socialists. Um, some of them will have a team of two or three ghostwriters for a series of books. And so, you know, don't think that it's just the Angela Davises of the world. It's people who you may be very shocked to find out. Not Angela. <laughs> Actually, Angela probably, Angela probably writes a lot more of her own stuff than some of these people, but let me stop, let me stop. <laughs> Academia is like the hip hop game. There's a lot of ghostwriting going on. So, mm -hmm. so that part was again that wasn't for me the 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 font of the shade for me. It was, <laughs> it, it was the it was the 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 host participant yeah. that I was struggling. Yeah, I'm like, I don't. Ooh. Comment, ooh. Really, I don't <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Erica, we, we took you off track there a little bit. No, Sorry right. about that. But um, right, no, I but, was talking yeah. about I was just talking about um the Niger Delta and mm -hmm. um the AFRICOM already being already on in that sort of general area. And then when uh bring back our girls hashtag kicked off, um it kind of reactivated um AFRICOM in that specific space. Um so yeah, so so they have been relying on um, Nigeria, I, I would say, has been relying on sub substandard operations throughout the Niger Delta region um, because of Shell. So Shell has challenged over the last few decades, they've been challenged for the last few decades by activists um, in the region uh, because of its business practices. So um, like all of the capitalist entities operating Africa, Shell's priority, of course, is generating pros profits with little investment as possible, which became a conflict of interest for the people who are already living there and consequently safe and humane working conditions. Um, so this all led to protests 
um, which then invited uh, this sort of U.S. Nigerian military cooperation. Um, so the political leadership in Nigeria and everywhere else in Africa, they're sort of beholden to doing everything to uphold the dominance of imperialism, um, including um, attacking their own people with trained uh, U.S. military forces. So the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag was what, um, 2014, I believe? One moment. And Erica, too, if I can just jump in. Um, sure. Because I think your piece is so important, and it was a pleasure to, to edit that. And um, I think people need to understand this idea of hashtag activism in its full context. When we think of, there's two moments that were like watershed moments that were both game changing and experimental for the capitalist state. And one of those is the Coney 2012 um, debacle, whatever you want to call that whole weird situation and the bring back our girls. Like these two moments, not only tested and sort of experimented um, how far you can drive people to believe in this, these, these hashtag activism, very empty and vain movements. Um, and they showed, they proved that you can have very profitable, very popular, very mass discussed um, influence and activism manufactured. So like when, Everything since those two moments, these massive social media moments where the whole world is told to watch and to use this hashtag for democracy and freedom, they almost all follow the same pattern that the Coney 2012 and the Bring Back Our Girl movements follow. It's, as if, it's as if they were writing an equation for social media marketers and managers at the Pentagon to follow, <laughs> and they've just continually hit copy and paste. Um, so I just always want to make sure people like, and even I think your your piece, Erica, does a great job because you even asked the question, like, if we were to go back in retrospect with what we know now and look at these movements, is there a single like coherent message or line that we can pull out from them? Like, is there anything coherent politically about these campaigns other than- Intervention. Well, intervention. <laughs> exactly. Intervention has always been the, um, like you scratch the surface of it, it's always the call for intervention, regime change, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wanna just make a short note about that, especially with regime change. Here in the US, when we have any sort of grievances, right? It's never really like down with the USA. It's we want justice <laughs> for what this occurred, right? So we're looking for sort of like an individual justice. We wanna see that cop removed. We wanna see that judge removed, that type of thing. Nobody's ever really calling for down with the whole U.S. I mean, you know. Well, that's how I interpreted the points you're both making. Sorry. I, that's no, how I interpreted here. the points you're both making, that the, the regime change in the context of the United States is get Biden elected after Trump, get a black whoever elected in whatever right get a whatever elected and whatever and and it, you know in the democratic party that's the regime change version you know and then overseas the regime change version is install another puppet dictator neo-colonial whatever 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 more corporate friendly mckinsey approved <laughs> you know leader like that's that's yeah that to me was you know it was so clear like you know uh put so-and-so over there and get Biden elected and then re-elected over here, you know? Or but yeah, like you were saying, support crypto. <laughs> I want to double back to bring back our girls for just this one thing, because yeah. I do want to talk about what resulted, because that happened in 2014. By 2016, the U.S.-Nigerian military cooperation was like this. Um, they were They were writing up um, potential plans for U.S. AFRICOM as a mentor for Nigeria's military efforts at promoting respect for human rights. Um, so they talk about the Nigerian military performing police duties and having been trained. And, you know, m many of us who work around AFRICOM do know that many of the military, much of the military in Africa is already trained by AFRICOM, if not a dual partnership with France as well. Um, but uh, the 
the need for external support for Nigeria military personnel on how to pr- approach the human rights issues we just became expansive. Um, so they really emphasized on how the U.S. AFRICOM, you know, African Command could support the Nigerian government's efforts to reduce incidences of human rights abuse by its security personnel. And then we fast forward to 2020, and that's the NSARS movement. All of those <laughs> police officers and all of those military personnel were trained by the expansive African forces on the west coast of Africa that expanded primarily due to this hashtag as a result of it. Because when we think, mm-hmm. when we look at the African, the first thing that they say is like it's supposed to be combated terrorism, the war on terror mm-hmm. in Africa. And the Boko Haram has always been depicted as terrorists. <laughs> and so that is all lock and step. Uh, with how they went about the expansion. And what Devin notes, that Coney 2012, yes, these things did make a major impact on how um, hashtags were to be perceived and how they were to be used. They tried it with Libya. But Libya wasn't a catchy one. It was just hashtag Libya. (laughs) They didn't have any catchy sort of phrasing with it. Once Coney happened, by the way, Sean King was also involved in Coney. That's a little fun fact. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> you wonder how far that scamming has gone. But <laughs> and that's he, why even Morgan State students were rocking that stuff. And I and that's yeah. how I knew it was an op or whatever they call it. That I was like, <laughs> even if Morgan State students are this activated, there's got to be. I was like, they these students are the least politically active students I've ever seen. And I was like, they run into my class of Cody, Cody. I was like, stop. I, th- yeah. I think it's so funny you bring up Sean King, Taco Mex. I think um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, um, you know, I wrote in 2016 for this Australian I academic blurred out. Manual, um that I don't think is around anymore, but I wrote about this phenomenon of what I called like pop sociologists on Twitter. And basically whatever was the trending topic of the day or the week, they just pop up. They're suddenly an expert in this thing. Everything they say is um, is the law, is completely accurate, infallible. And if you try to speak out against them, you're problematic, you're X, Y, Z, you're this, that, and the other. Um, but it, I, I, I said that it's because Twitter and social media in general operate under the assumption that the loudest in the room is the most correct. Yeah. Right. So and the, the funny thing thread. is what'd you say? <laughs> or the longest thread. Or the, the longest thread, the thread with the most retweets. But the logic at the base is like whoever is the loudest is the most correct. Mm-hmm. And we could I wrote that in 2016, right? Like 10 ops, yeah. 10 ops ago, 10 campaigns ago <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um and when you think of someone like Sean King and you think of these hashtag activism. Um, U.S. propaganda moments that take place, you know, it operates under that exact same pop sociologist logic. If the hashtag is able to be loud enough, if it's able to create such an echo chamber, if you are able to have the most people retweeting you, you become infallible in a sense, right? Like you, it's, you create your own expert profile for the day, basically. A perfect example of this is um, Joanna Hausman, horribly unfunny Venezuelan comedian who um, every time there is like the, the U.S. And Pentagon is trying to prop up a fake leader in Venezuela and call for regime change. Yes, she does. She, she suddenly for the next 48 hours is like super involved in Venezuela. She's tweeting hashtag SOS Venezuela, save Venezuela. Mind you, her father was a literal IMF banker who helped who helped orchestrate the destruction of Venezuela. But she's able to hop in and be this pop sociologist for the moment. She's able to be this sort of pop hashtag warrior for the moment. And because she has a big following and a blue check, whatever she says is like taken as truth. Right. And so I just think it's so funny. I wrote that piece in 2016 and then you write this in 2022. And it's almost like not only has nothing changed, but things have, in fact, gotten worse. And right. social media itself as a territory um, should be, in my opinion, politically conceded at this point. There's no the benefits, you know, for political purposes. 
if you're I think maybe YouTube might be the difference <laughs> because it is a video medium outside of a few channels. It's like these hashtag activism moments. You can't parse through propaganda anymore at this point. The masses have been led so far astray by this shit that it's like the point of trying to struggle over this terrain to me is like a dead point at this point. And to Devin's point, when the Coney 2012, and I see some people are like they don't they didn't even really know what it was about. So like um it was it was a film that became a hashtag. It was intended to expose um, the resistance army, the Lord's resistance army leader, Joseph Coney. Um, he was allegedly employing child soldiers and used young girls as sex slaves. That's the, I want to make a pin that point about the sex slaves thing, because that, that always comes up, too. Um, so in May uh, 2012, a HuffPost author, to Devin's point, this is a, a quote. They say, quote, we should be using technology to make activism more accessible at all levels. Um, they proclaim that this has be always been the intention for the use of technology. And then they go on to say, quote, social media's power lies in the vast reach and using it, we will soon be able to accomplish more with a few mouse clicks than was what was ever possible with a small army 100 years ago, unquote. Now, that's not dissimilar to what the co-founder of the National Endowment of Democracy says about Ned, that we are doing uh, covertly what they were doing, you know, 60 years ago, what the CIA was doing 60 years ago, we're now doing. Like, do you see? And they said that in 2012. So this has always been the intention to galvanize these sort of hashtags, to push a movement. Um, but what the result of Coney? Um, Obama deployed up to 100 military personnel and advisors to Museveni's regime, Museveni's army. Now, Museveni also has child soldiers um, as young as 13. So the government that Invisible Children and Obama uh, administration entrusted to rid Uganda of child soldiers has a military that is composed of child soldiers. So it was never really about the children. If we see right now in Central Africa, what's happening in the Congo, um, which is the source for many earth uh, metals and um, necessary for high-end tech and, and all the things that we use, etc. cetera. Um, this was about the U.S. colluding with its neocolonial puppets um, to further entrench the U.S. into Africa. Coney 12. Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, and don't forget, too, in that same year, for three years in a row, actually, but in that same year, in South Sudan, the youngest country on earth, because the U.S., as John Kerry said, was the midwife that birthed South Sudan, right? South Sudan, Hillary Clinton authorized the use of child soldiers for three years in a row. And that's just because that was the duration that she had the position to do so. And then it was carried out and continued under the Obama administration even longer beyond Hillary. But the point is, she authorized the use of child soldiers when it was beneficial to U.S. empire, right? So the whole entire notion of child soldiers being this like horrible, archaic thing, which it is, like no one should use child soldiers, but the U.S. was making sure there was child soldiers in Eastern Africa, right? And that is not even like conspiracy. This is well-documented. Journalist Nick Terse, who does a lot of great reporting on AFRICOM, he has written extensively about this, as have others at TomDispatch.com. So you know, it's it's so interesting to me that Coney and the Bring Back Our Girls all during the same time are using the exact same like their propaganda narratives are so based on reality that anyone searching for what was actually taking place with the U.S. on the continent would find these hashtag movements instead. Right. Yeah. If I were to search child soldiers, East Africa, you find I'm, I'm right. I'm going to get all this stuff about Kony and Boko Haram and all these things, you will not find within the first 10 pages, probably not within the first 20 pages of Google results that Hillary Clinton authorized the use of child soldiers yearly, annually, right? And so that's the other thing that these hashtag activism um, imperialist propaganda ops do is they divert so much attention away from what we should probably actually be discussing. And they're, they're intentionally, you know, there 
to funnel and to siphon energy, attention, resources towards these fake op type shifts. Right. Just like SOS Nicaragua and SOS Cuba is meant to, we, we can't even address the blockade or the sanctions, right? Those are just like after things. I know there was a lot of uh, right wing Cubans that were like to say, oh, the blockade is just an excuse, like those type of things. And we're also hearing that from a lot of uh, Iranian Americans here. Like the sanctions are bad, yes, but the regime is worse. And it's like, <laughs> what the, how much could the, how, I, I'm trying to, I think Romero, uh, Sebastian, I, I, I adore uh, Romero Funes, but he placed this so, I think this was great, um, as a great analogy. Like, if I, if, if I get robbed, or if there's somebody who's taking my money every week, and I have, a, I have children to feed, and, and, and I get robbed, and now everybody's like, look at you, you're, you're a terrible mother. You're not even feeding your kids. It's like, no, bitch, they're not paying me at work. <laughs> I'm making minimum wage and I just got robbed. I don't have the money. <laughs> but it's just like, that's how everyone looks at these countries that have been burdened with sanctions. Like, oh, you're a terrible country. You're not taking care of your citizens. Look at all of these immigrants coming over to the U.S. to flee from the bad regime. Um, and people just run with that. The other thing I think, too, that helps with, well, I, I again, I did want to note, both Coney, well, Libya, again, I said, Libya sort of was like a soft launch for this sort of thing because Libya was really one of the first hashtags that we've seen, but it only really said Libya. So it's really hard to trace how, to, to what extent. We know the result, <laughs> but it's really hard to trace to what extent it had an impact. Um, but from Libya to Coney to Bring Back Our Girls all happened under Obama, who was set to be the big tech president the STEM president, the president who was uh, for the gig economy and mm -hmm. things like that. He was being pushed uh, as that sort of framework. So I think that it, that's also important to know that as he was being pushed as this like innovator of tech and taking us into the future with you know, um, the promise of hope and all these young girls uh, coming up in STEM. And I think I noted, I noted that too, that a lot of the STEM connections are with uh, Raytheon yeah. <laughs> like the Girl Scouts of America has a contract for STEM. Mm -hmm. with um, but all of these things were happening congruently. So as the hashtag movements are kicking off, so is the the sort of state tech sort of uh, convoluting. Um, but but nobody really notices these things or don't. I think that it, as we've seen in the last ten years, and I think I noticed that there's not one coup. <laughs> or attempted coup that cannot be traced back to a hashtag. Mm -hmm. And whether that's Bolivia or what's happening in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, what was happening in Hong Kong, what happened in Ukraine. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's really important to to know. And that's really why I wrote it. But I, I asked Devin to be here because Devin was talking about um, being a ghostwriter, but Devin really is my clutch editor. I would have all these thoughts. Um, I, I make my outline. I have no role in mine. <laughs> I write my shit down. Yeah. Um, and then I, um, I really, the type of editing I do, it's really, you really have to snatch your paper away from me and be like, no, bitch, it's done. It's done. It's over. Stop writing. Because <laughs> I'm always like, no, I don't know. So I'm always yeah. at the last minute. Devin, check this, please. Make sure this makes sense. Because I'm never really, sh I, you know, just talking about it now, it's a lot to say. So I want to make sure that it makes sense in writing. Like, it's not just like I threw up all over paper with all these facts. It's, you know, it's facts that people can digest. And I think that Devin really helps me put that in a frame. Like, they don't rewrite it for me or anything, but they do like, is, are you sure you want to say this? Is there another way to say this? Um, think about this. Or did you think about this example? Or did you look into this? So just to direct me on how to do it. Um, and, and through that, we've had so many conversations about this um, because Devin does such great work, especially sort of naming the sort of things that's been happening um, on social media throughout the years. Most recently, Devin's work on around TikTok, I think is worth checking out. We have two of their published uh, pieces on Hood Communist if folks wanted to check those out around TikTok and then also, uh, you know, subscribe to their Patreon where you get all that work. But... Um, <laughs> Well, I think, you know, um, I appreciate I appreciate you, Ricky, as always, you know, <laughs> my sister. Um, 
as someone who's been an editor for about 10 years, it's always appreciative to hear that it's appreciated and, you know, useful and not just a waste of people's time. But <laughs> um, I also want to, you know, I want people to understand as well when we talk about these social media related things, we're talking about social media as an apparatus or a weapon of the capitalist state. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we can already see with this Elon Musk stuff sort of re removing a certain kind of veil that some people might have had, that these things are just like pet toys for a billionaire class. Like, it's, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is not interested in the infallibility of American free speech and democracy or whatever bullshit they say. These are just products that they're, they're making millions and billions of dollars for advertising at the end of the day. And so that is the profit motive is the extent to which anything radical will ever take place on these applications. Um, and I say that as someone who has worked in media and specifically social media for at least seven or eight years, I see all the time when I'm applying for jobs, um, positions at like the Department of Justice, the Department of State, Pentagon, White House, Democrat Party, they are, there's dozens upon dozens upon dozens of social media and communications jobs. So there are individuals being hired by the Pentagon, for example, who will be just assigned an account. An account could be, it's like, like a project manager almost, but digital. And your job is just to manage all of the communications related to this AFRICOM account right here. Now, who do you think those people are in conversation with? Who do you think they're developing their strategy with? Who are the higher ups who are giving them the information through which they have to communicate? Because my job as a communicator is to create communication strategies for someone else's information. That is literally the definition of the job. So if I'm applying to do that job at the Pentagon and my, I'm in a strategy meeting once a week with my higher up who's like, all right, this week, this is happening in Venezuela. This is what needs to be the strategy. So these aren't necessarily high level, you know, like I, I want people to understand the mechanics of how these things happen. It's not like just out of nowhere, someone woke up and decided, hey, today in Iran, this one psyop fake activist who lives, <laughs> who lives five minutes from the Pentagon is going to start a hashtag movement to free Iran. And we need you to tweet about this. They're like, no, we have a wartime editorial calendar, bitch. Get to, <laughs> get to work. Get, go to Tweet Deck and schedule them tweets. You know what I'm saying? And so, <laughs> no, it's true though. But even because no, honestly, because even if you look at, at, at the lady's Twitter, it starts with she notifies us that uh, someone has died in police custody, which was the young lady. The next 10 minutes that tweet has gone to, she was beaten to death. So, <laughs> like, and then it, like, it just escalates and escalates and escalates mm -hmm. to the point where it's like, well, now people don't even believe the CTV footage. You know, it's like, oh no, the, the Iranian regime meddled with that footage. Yeah. Because, you know, like, that makes more sense than this lady could possibly be lying because she doesn't even live in Iran. <laughs> like, all well, that she's getting is secondhand information anyway that she's reporting out yeah and, and, Iranian, and that's why i think my piece i'm like i always 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 refer to that piece about lived experience because i think that people slip and fall on that one's position um one's background does not make them politically correct does it make the analysis correct it doesn't make um the end you know the end conclusion correct me being for Trinidad, it's you know, me being Trinidadian doesn't mean that I am well versed in everything that's happening in Trinidad or that I can speak even for all the on the ground activities happening in Trinidad. Uh, but people in, in <laughs> the diaspora in the US seems to believe they are because they are diaspora, they are not fully entrenched into the US thought, they're not propagandized in the same way. You know, because we are, we're not from here, <laughs> so we, it's not hitting us the same, but it's like this level of uh, propaganda is every single day, every single day. Um, yeah. And I'll say, yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, no, my bad. I, so I'll also say, too, we are not susceptible as quote unquote leftist 
whatever you want to call yourself, communist, pan-Africanist, whatever, we are not susceptible to this digital propaganda warfare that takes place. And I'll give a perfect example. I remember this was maybe four or five years ago, but Zimbabwe was essentially having an internal crisis that was um, inflamed by Britain and the West and sanctions essentially um, are centering around Mugabe. And I had the voices of, like you said, diaspora Zimbabweans in my ear. And I remember tweeting and saying something neutral, you know, like both sides are bad or whatever, something that I was pretty much told to say by a diaspora Zimbabwean. And, you know, it took friends, I'm pretty sure you, Erica, among others, close comrades who I have a political relationship with, to call me in and educate me, give me, you know, the, pri the proper political education needed to not just hop onto a hashtag movement and to just follow along with it. And so even those of us who, who have, who, who do this shit, you know what I mean? Who are organizers, who do political education, who know to be aware of a certain kind of propaganda can at times fall victim to this sort of thing. Right. So for anyone to think that they're not susceptible to it, you know, and also I think that there's the age old principle, no investigation, no right to speak. Period. And so if people would just take a moment, stop, ask their political luminaries for some resources, where should we, they be looking? Um, what are the criticisms taking place? If, you, if people can take a moment and interrogate both themselves and the movement at play, that interrogation, interrogation being the all caps key word, you know, is the actual critical player that gives people the right to sort of speak on something. And then you're just a hater. That's the problem. Then you're just a hater and, and mm -hmm. the, you can't raise criticisms or questions. You, you... I dare, I wish you would go to some of these places and ask some of these people for their sources. I <laughs> Where did you get that? You will get. Yeah. It, it's going to get hostile very quickly. No. Yeah. Uh, anyway. And I think that just holding that sort of principle <laughs> behind, uh, because of the mechanism of social media where it's everything is rah rah. Um, it's become sort of dogmatic. Like, oh, you're only saying that because you hate the U.S. Or, like, this is what tankies do. And it's wild because tanky is very specific, right? So now mm -hmm. everybody who's <laughs> anti-imperialist is tanky, whether you're like Kwame Tur uh, Tureus or not, I mean, you know, like uh, Nkrumah Tureus or not, you are now a tanky because you are holding a particular line on anti-imperialism, uh, which is, is just so reductive. Uh, but people within empire and i guess that's like western chauvinism us you know um central thought but even in the chat when when i have discussions about this or like you know when i say like no investigation no right to speak and that people in their own countries especially when a lot of the countries that the u that are coming under like more visibility because there's like some sort of actions hanging around have had revolutions mm -hmm. so this is to say these people are not unaware of how to handle their shit <laughs> or how to get what they need to get. Um, what comes in the fact that it's like, it's sort of this like paternalizing or, or like of other colonized folks, like, no, we need to step in and we need to be the voice. And when you say, well, people can handle their own situation and maybe it's easier for the, the people in Iran to protest if they weren't like starving and hungry because of sanctions or if they weren't being hospitalized because of sanctions, more people take to the streets. It's why I say we're sanctioned here. When we think about food deserts and things like that, a lot of that's why we can't take to the streets in, in mass the way we would like to, to erect change. But I say that to say that people don't even look at these things or what they can actually do. And you have the, the only power you actually have because ain't nobody in, in Tehran listening to you. There's nobody in Iran listening to you. Nobody in the higher ups. They don't give a shit about what you're saying. Just like ain't nobody in Beijing listening to any, any shit y'all have to say about neither Beijing or Washington. They're not paying any attention to you or your little hashtags. What they, what, what the power you do have is what the, you are a constituent, right? You know that your politician is voting for these sanctions. Look at their voting records. Press them. Organize against that. And then you can then help the other workers of the world. You cannot help workers of the world trying to dictate what should happen to them based on what's being fed to you 
and a narrative here, and you don't even live there. You have no real grasp. And then the other thing is, people who are engaging in hashtag activism are a part of no organization. So they don't even have that sort of connection to even say, well, I may not know, but such and such I know is connected to this, and they may know. Like, they don't even have that to even So, try to But that's... That's the beauty of the trick bag, though, because then you go back to that politician and the first thing you're told by them and a whole cadre of 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 a, of, a, of an uh, echo system is we can't go too far left because we got to stop the rising fascism on the right here. We can't we can't vote even locally. We have to we have to vote for the, the lesser of evils because there's a worse version over here. Um so, so, but listen, I got a, I do have a couple of questions for the both of you. And then Dev, I know you had, uh, um, I, there were a couple other things you wanted us to talk about this morning. So I want to make sure if you, if you all want that we have at least some time for that. Um, but, but, but before we leave this particular topic area, uh, Erica, you do talk about, at least in passing, you make reference, uh, and I'm glad you, you, you referenced that, that discussion with Daruba about Black Lives Matter. Um, so, you know, as I was reading, I, I was like waiting for the, the, the looming <laughs> big hashtag elephant in the room. Um, uh, but then you also touched on something that, that indirectly I've been in a little debate with, with my man, Dr. Burroughs about just this week about Black Twitter. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you don't talk about black Twitter specifically, but in bringing up black lives matter and, uh, I, and then even something you said earlier in, in, in today, it, it, it made me think of this back and forth I'm having with, with Dr. Burroughs that I've had with a number of colleagues over the years that I'm not impressed with this black Twitter space, the, the efficacy, the, the effectiveness, the radicalness, the, and that, you know, there's often this, you know, and then he was telling me recently, Black Twitter does it again. If it wasn't for Black Twitter, we wouldn't have, and I forgot what the issue was that he was saying, something happened in some cultural space or whatever. Right. And I'm like, all right, well, whatever. So anyway, I wanted to see if we could blend that as, as if, 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 you know, we don't have to leave this topic, but, if, but we, before we outro this particular topic, Black Lives Matter and this issue of Black Twitter. I'm wondering what you think, uh, uh, you, one, what you said about Black Lives Matter and then what you both think about Black Twitter and, and its its role in all of this. Yeah, I, I've mentioned Daruba in passing because I, I still deeply appreciate that interview. Um, and I think he's done a number of different iterations with you around that sort of uh, Black Lives Matter as a hashtag. But when I mentioned it, it's not necessarily to say that it it, it functions in the exact same way as like Coney or, or Bring Back Our Girls, but it does function in the way uh, where we where things that seem organic become co-opted. Um, and I guess uh, that speaks more to like Two Blacks piece uh, that he wrote for Black Agenda Report. But um, yeah, it does more harm than it, it's done any good. I don't think that any of, I think that people genuinely are wanting to be helpful people. Um, so it's, it's a sort of social media phenomenon where people are feeling like they are activated. Um, they have the power in themselves to sort of become their own advocates and their own journalists and their own truth tellers. Um, but people sort of ignore that Twitter and all these other social medias are institutions. Um, they, they function as institutions. They maneuver as institutions. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, again, there's a profit margin like that Devin brought up. So there's a, there's sort of, um, the state is so deeply entwined into these, these apparatuses of social media, whether it's Facebook, TikTok, or Twitter, that it's really difficult to now say what is and what isn't actually occurring through these sort of hashtags. Like, I think people would like to think that change has been made but just as Devin said I wrote this shit in 2016 you know like I talked about this in 2016 and here we are seeing it even worse uh, because it's getting normalized and I think even with the Elon Musk situation and Twitter collapsing is this whole idea that black Twitter exists um, separate from Twitter and black Twitter like 
it, um, mm-hmm. as its own entity is what kept Twitter going. Um, and we need to preserve Twitter and, and all the black tweeters need to just like organize to preserve Twitter for our spaces because all of the, all of that we've been yep. able to accomplish. <laughs> And like I said, with Coney 2012 and with SOS Cuba and SOS Nicaragua and Bring Back Our Girls, all of these things didn't accomplish nothing. It accomplished nothing but more invasion, more U.S. military expansion, uh, more um, the Western hegemonic goals have been have been spreading throughout different regions, especially in the Americas, um, especially on the continent. So I, it's really hard for me to say, like, yes, yeah, certainly maybe... Um, smaller smaller scale things a uh, smaller scale hashtags like uh individual deaths or police shootings but then mm-hmm. since the since trayvon since mike brown as these individual police shooting deaths have occurred what has significantly changed within our community in the way that we organize around it or are we just seeing more and more hashtags like the whole idea of, of being the voice has actually taken precedent over actually organizing to stop certain things from happening. So people rather be the voice and rather be the the advocate online because it's less pressure. Um, and the people are weird socially. <laughs> they don't have to actually deal with nobody. They don't have to talk to people necessarily. And then they can go to sleep peacefully thinking they have done a good deed. They have, you know, saved or stood up for humanity. They have supported human rights. They have stood in solidarity with workers around the world um, from from their phone. And they never actually have to give more than they're giving. Um, and I think that's the sort of confusion that's existing right now around the use of, of social media and the use of these hashtags. Uh, for me, I always say I'm probably like I'm always on here, even when I'm in the chat. A lot of this is for agitation purposes. Like <laughs> a lot of it is, I'm in here to agitate. I'm in here to get people to siphon them into organization so we could do the real work. Um, even my friends, when I see them make a twe- a, a thread or a long post, it's like, no, why don't you um, submit that? <laughs> Stop writing that on Twitter. Submit it to the communists. Like <laughs> put it in 500 words. Like you yeah. know, because. I- People need to move away from that space. Yeah, I mean, I think the amount of the the word count used in some of these Instagram carousel infographics could also just be a strongly written article. I do agree with you on that. The Instagram infographic industrial complex is is mighty is mighty these days. Um, but I like the question about Black Twitter because this is something someone also recently asked me, and I at the time didn't really have care to give an answer to be honest but um i think that the reported impact connectivity community um activism of quote unquote black twitter is overinflated and overhyped um in many areas non-existent and in other areas outright regressive and reactionary and mm-hmm. bad for our community And I would suggest that all of the bad on Twitter greatly outweighs all of the good. Mm -hmm. And that even with the political education, sharing of resources, inviting to protests and organizations that has taken place, that happens largely in an echo chamber among people who already mostly agree with us anyways. And when we get outside of those circles, We learn that the entirety of Twitter is much larger than our tiny leftist bubble and that, in fact, people have been radicalized towards reactionary positions across Twitter, Mm. Black people and Black Twitter being no exception to any of that. Look at the ADOS movement. Look at the foundational Black Americans. Look at this Kanye and Candace Owens thing taking place. You know, I could keep going and keep going. Roland Martin has an active and engaged following on Twitter. Need I say more? Like, so <laughs> I, I think first you would have to point me to where, towards where Black Twitter actually existed. And instead, you're going to find where white journalists and editors at publications have just decided to call groups of Black people tweeting about stuff Black Twitter with a capital B and a capital T. Right. That's really the beginning and end of any real sense of Black Twitter. Now, the caveat I would say to all of that is there are small niche communities where social media has been great for them. 
right? Like we can't deny there's people whose rent has been paid because of social media. I see fundraisers all the time for black women or black trans women who need money, you know, for rent, for medicine, for their children, whatever. Um, we have like- See, we raised 20 grand for Daruba. For Daruba, there's, you know, the Black Panther um, Veterans Mutual Aid Project, incredible project that is, you know, social media plays a huge role in that, right? That's not to say we can't use these tools in extremely limited capacity for, for our own benefits, but I'm saying if we were to take and put on a scale and weigh the negative with the benefits, I think that the benefits of whatever Black Twitter is, and also I, I would say, because Twitter is a product that sells products, we are the products, um, I think that the power, the reported power, alleged power of Black Twitter dovetails, merges, and is entangled with consumption. Black Twitter exists because there's a Black Panther movie that needs to sell tickets. Black Twitter exists because some designer just did a collab with Telfar and they need to make sure Black people know about it. Like Black, <laughs> black Twitter exists because there's products that they want to sell to Black people or Can they I want- inter- I'm sorry to interrupt you, Deb, but that reminds me, I, I didn't even know what Telfar was, but reps black from them Twitter. reached out to us last year. Wait, I had a meeting. I had a whole phone call with two reps from Telfar about their interaction with BPM. And I, and the whole time I was like, what are you and who <laughs> what do you want? And then, and then, and then I was like, and I, and I remember I said to them, I, I said, I said, I don't think either of us knows who either of us is talking to very much and that this isn't going to go like, and we never had another call. Cause I was like, I was like, yes. we're not going to, this isn't anyway. That was just, anyway, sorry. You just, it just reminded no, no, me. No. I was like, what is this Telfar thing? Anyway, I mean, that, that is hilarious because it kind of proves exactly what my, yeah. my point, like Telfar is a, there's a Liberian, I think Liberian American designer. He's a black gay man who designs Telfar and therefore because of this identity, you know, it's like the new black. But that's not who I was talking to, though. No, like he was the side. It was it was a a white or 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 he I don't know. He was he was beige at best. I don't know what he was. I'll just say that. But he the 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 brother you're talking about was not the the. He was just no, a but I'm character. Saying, anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm saying right, Telfar right. as a brand exists. Right, right, right. So pretty. I'm not gonna say solely because of, but a large portion of it is this social media push that says mm-hmm. if you want to support Black businesses and Black people, and you want to support Black LGBTQ people, and uh, less democratized luxury is a term they use a lot. You know, because yeah. his ba- instead of his bag costing two thousand, it just costs three hundred. You know, like. It's so every everything we talked about for the past hour is very relevant to Telfar hitting Black Power Media up. Wow. And you know, even though the politics of BPM is at op- opposition to this black capitalist, black luxury, whatever you want to call it, they still see a profitable value in spreading their message on a channel like BPM, even if y'all openly antagonize everything they stand for. And, <laughs> You know, and that just shows the power of this social media shit. Wow. Yeah, that's deep. I was like, who is yeah, that's deep. Okay. Oh, uh Daruba's in the chat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, what's up? oh Daruba. Living legend. Oh yeah, we did yeah, we're discussing hashtag movements. What we're not discussing, Daruba, is Dion going to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's My bad, man. I love you to death, D. I can't help it, man. I'm a mess. <laughs> anyway, hey, real quick, I just saw this as you were talking and you mentioned Ricky HBCUs. I, I just read a paragraph that explains my entire career at Morgan State. Um, it, it's talking about a new. It, it's referring to an, 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 an existing initiative at Morgan, but but it's saying that Morgan has launched three new research centers this year, in an effort to become the first HBCU to hit uh, R one status. Uh, the Center for da- Data Analytics and Sports Gaming Research, the Center for Equitable Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Systems, and the Center for Urban Violence and Crime Reduction. That. That's it. 
and 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 the, and and at least four million of the forty million donation by philanthropist Mc, Mackenzie Scott towards establishing the three endowed professorships in brain science, predictive analysis, cybersecurity engineering, wow. and psychometrics. Damn. Woo. And here That's I was anyway. about Ned. <laughs> Ned, um, Ned scholarships and Ned programs in the school. Uh, but they doing. So is Morgan still expanding? Morgan is oh, set yeah. to a university city to make East Baltimore. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, the if, every time you know there's constant building, the 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 center is expanding, you know, what is the the Northwoods, you know, the new Northwoods or whatever. <laughs> it's it's new. They moved the McDonald's, updated the McDonald's, got the new touch screen in there to order stuff, and then they got the 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 DTLR stores up and running, and then they got uh, some other businesses and I saw all these white men in suits the other day <laughs> walking around measuring stuff <laughs> and, that was, and and you know outlining what's going to happen with that i was just like yeah yep 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 i was like this this looks about it's right and then of course the new police I'm, center I'm, is right there too i'm sorry it's a coffin too so i'm interested in in at what point are they going to because one is on the east and one is on the west and at what point is that expansion going to like how I mean, far far in are they intending to go? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, wait, whose audio is going? Tom Porter's in the building. Speaking of legends, we got all the legends in here this morning. Whose audio is gone? Sorry about that. Anyway, um, anyway, but thank you for that. But both of your answers to to in response to 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 uh, um, uh, my questions there about Black Twitter and and BLM. Um, I did star. There were a couple. I think uh, questions. Yeah, I think we co- I think we covered the BLM hashtag. I I think I can't remember if your piece mentions or if you talked about Yemen being part of this hashtagery mess. No, um, no. I did not. Uh, mention- okay. Okay. Peace to Fari. Yep. Had some of his images uh, hijacked. I'm not surprised. You take a lot of good ones. Uh, shout out to Yuri as well. Um, great guest today. She should debate Kalanji and the Iranians he had on who de facto supported U.S. backed color revolution. Boo. Oh, that's deep. You trying to you trying to you trying to spark BPM beef? I'm sure we. I, I think that would be great. I missed that part, at least that part of the discussion. So I don't know if if any of you caught any of that or had any response to that. But I think the perspectives of those color revolutions has been made clear here today. Yeah, um, I, I caught I caught a piece of that and disagree with a lot of what they were saying. Um, but I do. I see something in the chat that's really interesting. They say sounds of Saint Elsewhere says Dariki and Devin think that building self-hosted open source alternatives to corporate social media is a worthwhile effort to blunt the negative effects. Um, well, wait a second, because that actually that that you that does dovetail with one question I do have here. You you mentioned earlier that this space has been seeded already politically. So then, what what? You know, just to piggyback off of that, what do you suggest should be the, wanna, the, the next step? I'll go. I'll go. Yeah, I, I think that um, one, we have to ask, you know, first, social media is relatively new. And we're talking about Twitter today, largely. Twitter is especially new in the grand scheme of things. Uh, many of all of us on this call are old enough to remember a time before Facebook and Twitter and social media in general. And then we're also old enough to remember a time when it existed, but it did not take over every aspect of our lives and our careers. So I say that because the question of should we build a new open source by the people of social media, to me, is asking the wrong question. To me, the question is what exists? How did we get the word out about these various things before there was a Twitter? And what I mean by that is like I think of Cuba. Cuba the only time they have used social media to have any kind of political discussion, call for a protest, anything like that is some op shit with no actual material analysis at play. But what they do have in Cuba, because they're not dominant on a digital space, they have public parks, public meeting spaces, community centers, barbershops and restaurants, all of these various spaces, real in life spaces, 
um, function the way we envision or or pretend or want for Twitter and these social medias to be like this public forum of free knowledge and flowing ideas. How did we have? How did like the Black Panthers, right, have this political program that they spread across the country and gave in depth political study to the masses without some digital space for us to go to? So to me, the question of like. Should we create a social media for the people? We're clearly social media is filling a void of something deeper and something better and something more important. And I think we should remove social media from the equation yeah. and go back to the source, sure. right? Sankofa kind of idea and go back to the source and figure out what the fuck were we doing before social media that worked so much better than social media? Get out into your community, go to a community center, a library, a public park, um, you know, things like that. Like, Ricky, you give away books through liberation, through reading. And every person who a book passes into their hand or anyone who comes and talks to your table at the event, you're teaching them, you're educating them, you're building community with them, you're sharing your contact information with them. Like movements and campaigns and, and radical revolutionary politics are not going to take place over a Twitter or social media app because they historically have not taken place there. And we have yet to see them take place there yet to this day. So I, I like the question because it's like, we shouldn't be thinking about how can we save social media or how can we create our own social media? It's like, do we actually need social media? And what does the historical record show we have gotten done with it versus for people around the world who don't use it as their organizing space, who are miles ahead of us. Miles ahead of us. The only um, problem that I have with that just very quickly is the concern I have with that. Not that I disagree so much is that, is that I keep thinking of, of that Huey Newton point about nations that, that the world that you're talking about, Dev, that, that we might remember or, or have, have even fully grown up in, doesn't exist anymore. We can't return to that. There is no source to which we can return anymore. And this new media environment, particularly in this country, is creating something different uh, that, that, that it, again, doesn't exist, particularly for younger people. Uh, so that would, that's the, the biggest concern I have. Um, again, thinking of a trick bag that we're stuck in. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. No, no, no. I definitely appreciate that. And I think that to me, the answer is to have a very clear and sober material analysis of the limits of what you can actually do and cannot do on social media. Right. And I think that as organizations, right, as communities and organizations, as we develop an analysis around what those limits actually are, that analysis and those limits should inform how much time, energy, and effort we put into social media as something we can save or not. If I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but yeah. it's all about like the, the limitations of what you can actually do with these tools. But to your point, Dr. Ball, when you said that I was thinking about like Lennon and Marx and, and how they explain it, like I know people talk about like communalism, right? And and but I think that we have to really understand that we are at a point of capitalism and we need to like address this and, and to sort of this materiality and move forward as opposed to like looking behind because those, that system doesn't exist anymore. So I was thinking through that. But the other thing I was thinking about and that I'm always thinking about when people are, are, I think the sort of trigger reaction is we need our own space. We need to build our own things. And I'm thinking about press TV and the Iranian servers that the U.S. froze. I mean, they, they have their own servers. They have their own um, internet and their own uh, media apparatus that in the U.S. could simply just say no. <laughs> Sorry. Well, think, look, think and about <laughs> think think yeah. about R RT. I produced multiple documentaries through RT. Therefore, when YouTube woke up one morning and decided they wanted to remove all RT content from YouTube, that included the documentaries I produced. So look, think of the ripple effect of the hundreds of hours worth of content that you could only get from somewhere like an RT or press TV or CGTV that was just erased overnight. Like literally overnight, they were like, we actually don't want you on YouTube anymore. 
50,000 views, however many views, we don't care. And so again, I think it's revealing a limit to these spaces that we're so dominant on if it can just overnight be taken away. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Let me not. Let me not. <laughs> so when, when, uh, and thanks to Ruba and, and, um, you, you know, McLuhan, I would love, I, I tried and, and unfortunately, um, I can't remember her name, but she, she does, she's, she does, she's not interested in, in public, whatever but but I'm, i really want to have more discussions about McLuhan um because one of the things that he he would talk about and of course that's where the media is the message comes from or the medium is the that 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 he would talk about how what what media we produce today digitally is a reflection of what we think existed in the past and he equates it to driving forward while looking in the rearview mirror um, so, so even movies that are depicting something in the future are really a reflection of what we thought of the future in the past. <laughs> and, and, and it, anyway, and I, and, and, and I'll stop there only to add that, that I would encourage, I would love for us to have a collective viewing of uh, McLuhan's Wake, which I think is the, an incredibly good documentary about McLuhan. And I would even like to 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 under the watchful, careful eye of of people who administer medicine, uh, enjoy that. I think would enjoy that with with some psilocybin support. I might have to think about that when I think about looking at that again, because that movie, that documentary, boy. Uh, anyway, McLuhan is deep, and 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 anyway. So I just I just shout out to McLuhan and for all of his conservative white Eurocentrism. <laughs> I still think he was deep. Anyway, uh, either of you, sorry, go ahead um, with no, anything. I mean, I'm was, not sure. Okay, that's really my main point. I think we talked about this. Yeah, when when everything was happening with the Ukraine proxy war and, and accounts were getting shut down left and right, mm -hmm. and then that became the we need our own, we need to build our own. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I think people are looking at like places like Rumble. And expecting mm -hmm. that that would be the sort of uh, <laughs> uh, welcome that we would receive, or like you know, mm -hmm. Rumble exists for reasons. I like I always say, liberal democracy supports fascism, so Rumble <laughs> exists for reasons. They're not going to mess with Rumble. They're going to talk about it for you know as a mm -hmm. as a gateway to elections, but they're not really going to mess with Rumble. Yeah. If we came with a Pan African mm -hmm. like socialist communist. Like a space with anarchism and and having those particular discussions on a platform day in and day out. No, they suddenly will start it. paying attention. Yeah, lot, like they they already because the, the accounts that do are already gone from Twitter. Right, Sometimes exactly. I'm gone, I'm gone. Like the accounts that already do those things day in and day out have already been axed out. So to think that you know we can just move away from that and then there would be you know they'll just leave us be. I think really comes to that really speaks to the lack of institution building that we're already doing like we're not really building institutions as is separate from the internet but i think that if we start to consider building institutions and what that looks like and, and building liberated zones then yeah social the use of social media or how we would use social media would would um we would start to think through that more. It would start to, you know, make more sense of how it would actually work because we were we would already be establishing some things. I think that looking to organize for a different space with a completely unorganized masses of people is not going to be productive or any more productive than what we're seeing. Yeah, hundred percent agree. I also know. So, yeah, what, go ahead. Mm -hmm. My last point I'll say is. When, you know, like I said earlier, I've worked in social media where I'm like or like doing social media for an org or something like that. And then like number one rule we always say to our to clients, to anyone is social media is not the end in of itself. It's a means towards an end. So the end is never just to like get a follower, get a retweet. The end is something convertible, something larger. Someone's purchasing something. Someone's opening a, a, a link. For us as the left, we have to understand what the means and the end are. Is the goal to get a lot of followers? 
is the goal for them, someone to see a 60 second clip of Daruva Ben Wahid talking on Black Power Media. And then they want to go and watch the whole 30 minute interview. They're like, dang, he's spitting some fire right here. Let me go check it out. And then you go and you start doing your research, right? Those are two completely different. It's a different end goal than just trying to create followers and engagement and have like, you know, the, my point is anything on social media has to only be a stepping stone to more information. Any political education on social media is just in order as a bridge to get someone towards more political education that's more in depth. So I, I never think if once social media itself becomes the end goal, you cross the line from organizer to influencer. And we have a lot of organizer influencers right now. Um, influencers too. <laughs> it's no different. So, so, so real quick, just because I want to make sure we, we have some time for this, because you, you sent Dev uh, a couple things, including something on Israeli propaganda, which I didn't get a chance to look at, admittedly. But but I did want to ask you about this other piece uh, that you 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 sent a couple of examples uh, of 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 rappers. And I'm wondering, given that if it's not Jews who are supposed to be running everything, it's certainly the queer community. And I'm wondering why these rappers you sent aren't more popular just by default. Like, why aren't we just inundated with a whole bunch of these MCs that you sent? Um, who I will say, as I said before you all got here, you know, I, I listened to at least uh, a good portion of what you sent. And um, I just have to, I'm, I'm, I just have to admit it, it I, I can't say it, there's no bias against the sexual content, but just even even hetero or not, I'm not I'm not interested in young people's sex lives. I don't want I just don't want to hear about any of it. So I'm, I'm and 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 the aesthetic sound of this newer generation. I'm just I, I'm just old. I think I'm just old, man. I, so I like I I. Anyway, but but I recognize the talent and the skill, and then other than whatever politics are associated with the industry, I would not, again, sort of seriously to, to my initial question, I'm not sure why these artists wouldn't be more popular, but uh, I'm not hearing them discuss certainly in my classes uh, as much as others. So I, anyway, but I wanted to give you some, some, some time to bring up and talk about these artists um, and it, you know, and anything else that you wanted to. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's, towards the end of the year and you start reflecting on what was the best album of the year or what album had the biggest impact on you and music, you know, it's like you, you start to look at the year and review towards the end of the year. And um, these two albums for me, and I think if more people, like you said, if they had a more, I guess, mainstream audience, many would agree. Um, you know, there was a level of artistic creativity uh, lyricism, talent, and storytelling that for me made them the best albums of the year, bar none. Um, one of them was the the album Svengali by Cakes Tequila, who's a New York rapper. And in the year, same year we had Drake and Beyonce, two of the largest, if not the largest artists on earth, who suddenly overnight took interest in like house music, ballroom, LGBTQ sounds and aesthetics. Um, people forget that there are artists at the margins of hip hop who have been working within those exact same sounds for decades now, who have put these sounds on the map to an extent, who have progressed the genre, and who've also done so while doing storytelling. You know what I mean? Giving us fresh stories in hip hop that we haven't gotten yet anywhere else or that we haven't gotten in quality, <laughs> you know? And so um, I, I think with Cakes the Killer, he has an approach that is a very classic, in my opinion, maybe not classic, but a very New York sounding style when he raps. He's very lyrically adept. He's gone and he's like freestyled for Ebro and freestyled on all the radios. Um, but I think the reason why these so he has gotten on those at least that level of, of attention. So he That's yeah, he, he infamously when he released his debut album, Cakes to Killer, was invited on to Ebro and freestyled. And uh, very infamously, the interview was not very good. They just focused on him being gay pretty much the entire time. Every question mm -hmm. came back to that. Um, 
So what happens is with a lot of these smaller artists, especially like TLGBQ artists, the media does not treat, treat them well, as one could imagine. You go, you drop an album and you want to go on an interview and talk about an album and you sit there and they just want to know who you're having sex with and, you know, how that's relevant to your music and all these identity questions start popping up. And you can't ever just sit and listen to an album and appreciate the fact that this man is sampling, for example, house beats and disco beats from the 70s through the 90s, who has Harry Fraud and some of the dopest producers on the album that he's lyrically out rapping mainstream rappers. You can never focus on that. It has to be focused on like the identity portion. And so that's why when I sent these albums to you, I really was just like, look, the music is what's dope in these. Um, and I think it's very, very important right now, given what the mainstream billionaire capitalists of the music industry um, are doing with sort of house music, ballroom, all these different genres. It's very important to support these kind of artists right now. So that's, you know, my short list. No, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I, you know, again, I was even listening to um, a little bit of the new Black Star album and was thinking kind of the same thing. Like, I think I'm just becoming a cliche where, <laughs> where if anybody advances a sound, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know. I just wasn't feeling it. But it's clear that with 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 with, with cakes the killer that it, at least uh, the lyrically and in terms of the sound it's as good as anybody that else that I I don't distinguish it from anything other than the identity the sexual content etc. Um, but uh, um, which you know again at this point I don't want to hear anybody. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I think, <laughs> but yeah, no, but so yeah. Anyway, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I think um, it's important for me to make it. I'm not saying that these projects are rev politically revolutionary. I don't want that mm -hmm. anyone in the chat to think that. <laughs> I'm just mm -hmm. simply saying, you know, if we think of hip hop as an extremely captured territory for politics, like black politics, it's very captured by the capitalists. Um, the only ones left with a semblance of meaning in their art in hip hop are those who are relegated to the margins, in my opinion. Um, and that includes a lot of the quote unquote conscious rappers, you know, um, even like, you know, your fave, Mumu Fresh, people who have something to say are marginal in hip hop nowadays. And so I just try to uplift those people. The other person was um, Cakes to Killer. I mean, I'm sorry, Mickey Blanco. And he had an album, Stay mm -hmm. Close to Music. And by the way, Mickey Blanco in in um, he he pretty much co-wrote and ghost wrote all of like Tiana Taylor's that famous seven track album. Keep that same energy. He wrote Kanye West's verse for Kanye on that album. Didn't get paid for it. He wrote multiple of Tiana Taylor's verses. Didn't get paid for it. Um, what is, wait, wait, wait. What does that mean? And what is that? Is that a scandal going on? Well, or what does that mean? This was, is, is, this was from like a year or two ago. Um, you know, everyone at Tiana Taylor and Kanye West management were just not responding to Mickey Blanco and the album had been out for like a year and he had not got paid. So he took to Twitter to do it publicly. And Tiana Taylor's response was, that's none of my business. So mind you, it was, it was. mind you, the song, the song that Mickey Blanco is on, on Tiana Taylor's album, Mickey wasn't even originally credited as a feature artist. No. Produced wow. the song, wrote the song, had a verse. And is on the song. And but it's also, but song. you should know that Tiana also didn't really have much say in that album either. It was not supposed to be seven tracks. She went and did her own thing separately to release more tracks, but that was all under good music and Kanye. Listen, all I know is mm -hmm. Mickey Blanco said that Tiana Taylor would come into the studio and say, what are my lyrics? What am I singing today? And then leave. And so the work ethic for me is not there. Nonetheless, Mickey Blanco is a black trans person who is openly HIV positive. And this is the first album of theirs where he openly talks about his experiences being HIV positive, the stigma, the impact, the way community has treated him. He's very vulnerable. And he talks about how when he first was like when he was younger, he um, 
he only wanted to date white men. So he talks about how stupid that was, how how much he was having self-hate. Tell me how many mainstream rappers have talked about when they only wanted white partners and they're better now. You know, like there's a level of vulnerability to the to the storytelling that I just haven't heard anywhere else, at least not this year. You know I heard I mean? that. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up and reminded me as I, I heard that on this album, uh, that point. And then um, uh, I was I was interested. I saw, you know, what for me is a return for Saul Williams. I haven't heard from him mm-hmm. in forever. I'm sure that's my fault. Michael Stipe, I was never a fan, but I was shocked to see that that I was like, wow, Michael Stipe. So I was, I, that's interesting. Now, this track here, I did. I, I appreciated your feminism is not my feminism. I, I admit that that spoke to my pettiness personally, <laughs> uh, um, you know, but but again, so so for me, again, it's it's a clear recognition of talent. This is not a question of talent. It's just. I'm just, a, again, I think I really am a cliche. I'm just not, there's something about the sound and the, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. I want, I don't know, whatever it is, but, but uh, um, anyway, yeah. So I'll, I'll but say, all of that is deep though. What you're saying about the industry and the, these, these relationships is deep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll say as an avid BPM watcher, a listener, you know, you definitely have a boom bat preference um, that is very, very pronounced definitely you know we're, but we're working we're working to interject some 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 new sounds in there i just think that in in order to see any potential for hip hop being anything meaningful i'm not saying revolutionary i'm saying meaningful i think you have to go to the margins of the industry itself yeah. where where the influence of this capitalist musical industry is is sort of weaker and weaker the more marginal you get. That's why I think you enjoy an artist like Mumu Fresh, for example, because while she is an astound and and very, um, she has many accolades and whatnot, she is, she does operate at the, at the sort of margin of the industry. You know what I mean? Just like many other people who actually have something to say in their music. Um, and even, you know, Mickey Blanco on this album, like the My Feminism and Not Your Feminism is not some revolutionary nope. gender, but there's a lot of truth in it mixed in there with experience and analysis. And the overall production of the album is extremely jazzy and musical and instrumental um, in ways that we haven't heard in a long time. So, you know, that's just my... But I think your point, I really, your point, because I heard that part where he's talking about the the whole I used to date white men thing. And Mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, like, you know, all these prominent rappers that are brought to my attention, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, Kodak Black and others who speak openly about, negatively about dark skinned women and all this Mm -hmm. other stuff and women in general, to hear somebody, you know, what for me is making a a very uh, uh, racially advanced, (laughs) you know, uh, uh, you know, yeah. whatever is 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 or it, what, what, even if people don't see it as advanced making a very different headed in a different trajectory that harkens back to the hip-hop that i remember growing up where everything was uh sort of uh, or most of it was involving some level of black pride um mm, right. even heavy d did the the what was it? No, no coffee, no sugar, no cream. That's the only type of girl I want on my team or something like that. Everybody even had like a little bit of a black pride in there. Yeah. And nowadays, so I heard that was like, wow, that's, that's, that's <laughs> okay. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, imagine, imagine the state of hip hop, right? That a rapper very vulnerably and truthfully saying, I used to only want to date white people. That was fucked up of me. I'm moved on from that. That in our eyes is like a breath of fresh air. Like that's how right, right. how far gone hip hop is that we're like, oh my god, like thank you. You know what I'm saying? Like that just shows how far we've really come. Um, for sure, for sure. And yeah. I also, I, yeah, I think good. the last thing I'll say, you know, um, there was I was watching a week or two ago when y'all brought up the topic of. 21 Savage saying Nas is not relevant. Um, and you were like, you know, I want Nas to just hit him with an either. <laughs> and, <to> like, <laughs> and as someone, I talk all this mess about hip hop, but I also listen to the ratchet shit and love everything. Uh, you know, 
I actually think 21 Savage was speaking an unfiltered truth. Nas just dropped an album, and I guarantee you half the people on my contact list don't know he drops an album. That's not to say Nas is not influential. He's not a master at his craft. Um, maybe he's kind of ran out of stuff to talk about a little bit. But he to say he's relevant would be, in my opinion, a lie. Because he's mm-hmm. not unfortunate. And that's unfortunate because even as corporate as Nas has gotten, he still at least has some kind of semblance of a message in his music. Um, but I, I, I think 21 Savage got a lot of hate for that. And in reality... I don't know where he lied. Like, I don't know. Mm. I, and again, I like Nas. I think he's a legend. But if we're talking about relics, like who's relevant, and you put a 21 Savage next to a Nas, that's not to say 21 Savage is a better rapper. It's to say if we're talking relevancy, right, right. A lot of people have to grapple with what that word relevant means. Ah, <laughs> somebody I'm mad at Dev in the chat. Fight me. <laughs> Fight me. Show, show me how Nas in the chat. Show me how Nas in this current moment has more relevancy and influence than 21 Savage. I'm not saying I agree with it or think that's how it should be. I'm not saying that merits more talent for one. Say, Dev isn't sharing. <laughs> Dev, if you put him down, I'll pick him up then. Hey, hey I ain't I never done a psychedelic it. in my life, and Erica knows that. Oh, <laughs> Shame, shame on you. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> you know, listen, I'll come no, back on and argue with playing. people if they want, but I, I, I just, you know, I don't know. I no, I, I have to, I, I, even I would have to, it, 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 at minimum, acknowledge the point, if not, you know, fully. I mean, you're right. I mean, honestly, you're right. I mean, you know, when, if, if, again, every, every semester that I have a class that either about hip hop or where it comes up, which is my greatest connection. If, if, if it's kind of like the way people might mention in their minds a Michael Eric Dyson or Cornell West, they're mentioning it based on name recognition, not because they've appreciated or engaged the content. Right. Um, so they'll say, "I appreciate Nas," but you haven't listened to Nas, and you know, have you really listened to the? And then people, even my generation, I haven't even gone and listened carefully to the new album. I mean, I haven't, you know, gone rushing out to get a Nas album in a long time. So I mean, I have to, you know, even, you know. But but I still would have preferred his response to be an ether as opposed to let's do a track together. <laughs> no, nah, I, I think he chose the right, you know, it's a lot of rappers dying left and right. It's a lot of I know, know, man. I know. You're right. I would love you to are right. and twin one on the same album. Also, I did listen to the Nas album. And it was his last albums have not registered high for me, but I think at this all. last at all, at all. Like he needs to, <laughs> he needs to like mute the word Babylonia from his vocabulary for the rest of his life. But well, look, Nas. I mean, I, you know, unfortunately, I think Nas, like a lot of MCs, you know, particularly ones that of my generation, I would hear references that they would sound deep making, and then you follow up and do any level of research, and then you see that they haven't done any themselves. So. Yeah, I mean, it's not. It, 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 he hasn't been spending the last several decades studying Babylonian no. history. <laughs> no. just... and he's like, one of the things that I always like mention is that Nas, when him and Damian Marley did the joint album, they go at Mother mm-hmm. Be Hard. Like, they go after him as a leader that's killing his own people, which is mm-hmm. like the, the, the typically what you would hear in those sort of regime change mm. kind of dialect. Uh, but he, he does that. And, um, there's no taking back from that. There's no like, oh, maybe I didn't know what I was talking about. And people take Nas on his word when he does those type of things because people have it in their mind because he uses, like he would reference Egypt and he would reference the pyramids and things like that, that Nas might in fact know what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so people kind of just run with that. Now, like that was a big track too. And it wasn't like a like a slip line. It was a whole verse about mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, I just sat with a Senegalese, a young Senegalese scholar that said Czech Anta Diop didn't have his stuff together straight. And so I'm still reeling off of that. So if 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 Diop can get checked after 40 years, certainly yeah. Nas can. Good God. <laughs> but listen, De- I, you know, I don't know how you all are for time. I don't want to rush us off. Uh, I know we're coming to the end here, but you did also send a piece about this this Israeli propaganda. I don't know if you have time or if you all want to mention that or or, or chop it up on that at all. 
or save that for another time uh, or whatever. But uh, another 10 think, minutes. Uh, yeah, I have some time today, luckily. Um, but the last so thing. I this up here. No, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think um, I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Seneca Vot. I'm going to send him a link to this so he can actually listen to this. In my very, very first African and African diaspora uh, studies 101, you know, very, very first class that my first week in college, um, Dr. Seneca Vot, he pulled up the Nas song with Lauren Hill, If I Ruled the World. Um, and he's like, I'm just going to play it. I, you know, this is how we're going to start class. And everyone's like rocking. We all recognize, we, everyone knows that song, you know, it's a hot song. It's one of those songs that's lasted the test of time. Anytime it comes on, you're going to play it. So he, we listen to it. And then he says, all right, now we're going to listen. And I'm going to put the lyrics up on the screen and we're going to read the lyrics together. And he starts getting into the history that Nas is proclaiming. And it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> <It works. laughs> and he's saying the some you know not all the song but a lot of it is some fake history and some just very inaccurate history and he it's dr seneca vi y'all can look him up he's the one who gave me the analysis that the, the diaspora is a state of mind i, I love dr seneca vi's work and he asked the question do the benefits outweigh the negative of, in this song? That's such a popular song spread Black history, but at the same time, there's a lot of faults in the history that it's spreading. And so he, I just, you know, I've thought critically about Nas for a long time, pretty much since the day Dr. Seneca Vi brought that song up to open and to start his course that semester. And so, you know, I just ask people again, Nas is a legend, but is he relevant and is he as deep as mm. people like to claim he is? So that's all. You know, 19, 19 raps. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. Did didn't, he do, didn't he also do a joint album with Kanye West a few years ago? Did anyway, he? Oof, he did. Man. He did. But uh, Kanye mm. produced a seven, a seven track album for him. But anyways, we're, you know. Well, if we go back far enough, Kanye produced for Dead Prez too. So yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah. we, we got to We got to Emotion. He he's he's attached to some, he's attached to some classics now. This that's that's gonna be difficult going forward. He he was a album for Kanye. But he produced an album for Nas like three or four, like very recently. Like not um, he produced all of them. Anyways, anyways, you know. Well, I'm on record from years ago, not the, uh, on record on a PFW radio show, is saying that Common, one of Common's many lyrical errors, was saying on that on that album that Kanye produced for him that in finding Kanye, he had found the new Primo, and I was like, hold, hold I was like, hold your, hold your goddamn roll there, Common. <laughs> Kanye ain't no premier. Let's get the hell out of here with all of that. But but he was trying to say the same thing then. Is premiere still relevant? And and in, in the context of Kanye, he wasn't. And I'm like, damn that. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Um uh, just to add, just to end the show on, on maybe a little more substance and relevance, uh, you did send this story um about a, 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 a what has to be, you know, Netflix is just the best. Uh so this has to be good. If net if Netflix is telling the Israeli Palestinian colonial conquest than depicting the Nakba. This has got to be good. This has got to be good. Off the break. This is going to be great. Oh yeah. My God. Oh yeah. My God. I sent over the story because um, I Ooh. found it, you know, I know you do like media studies and this is right. Feels like very down your alley. So when you have more time, I'm sure you, you know, can dig oh. in deeper. Yeah. Um, but there's this film by a Jordanian Palestinian filmmaker you know, Netflix likes to pick up small independent films like Residue by Marari Jaraima from D.C. that talks about gentrification. They like to every now and then pick up like small indie films to kind of give them credibility, I think. And so the film is one of a kind because it depicts the 1948. Oh, wow. Film. Yeah, I'm sorry. I must I misread this. So so they're actually so this is they're targeting it because, as it says here, it's it says. Yep from the perspective of a girl watching Zionist militias kill her fire, entire family. Yeah. Right. yeah including so a baby. 
it tells Damn. a true story. So it tells a completely true story from the perspective of a 14 year old Palestinian girl in the 1948 Nakba when Zionist forces slaughtered this village in Palestine. And so they, you know, Netflix is riddled, completely full to the brim with Zionist propaganda. Like you cannot watch a foreign film on Netflix without there being some Zionist propaganda. You can't watch- Foreign film? They got the mighty Zohan on there and all that kind of bullshit. Everything. You, name? you know, you, House of Cards has, prop, like everything has Zionist propaganda. All of them. House of Cards, all of them, all of them. They all find ways to sneak in Israeli propaganda. So then you have one film, just one film that accurately describes Palestinian life, the brutality Palestinians faced. Um, I have watched about the first half of the movie. I'm going to watch the other half tonight. But mm. Israelis have been um, in mass by the thousands, mass giving it one and zero star reviews yeah. on IMDb, on Rotten Tomatoes, on all of these streaming platforms and, and review sites in an attempt to get Netflix to take it down. So Netflix has already censored the movie in Israel. They're no longer showing the film in Israel on Netflix, and they're trying to get it taken down globally. So in response, Palestinians are asking everybody to go and watch it, to go watch it, to talk about it, to give it five-star reviews. I will say it is a heavy watch from the get-go, mm. but it is a really, from what I've seen so far, I'm not Palestinian. I'm not going to say if it's radical or revolutionary or whatever or not. That's not for me to say. But I know that from what I've seen so far, Israelis are mad because it just shows the truth of what happened. Right. And they're I, big. Mad. I do want to note, though, I don't I don't necessarily even think they're mad about the truth. I think they're mad about who is telling the truth. Yeah. Um, mm. I think when we look historically, Palestinians have never been really allowed to tell their truth um, because it's Israeli. Um, based movies or there's movies based on Palestine but they are always either sympathetic to Israel um, showing like both sides are bad or um, they take a sort of liberal Zionist framework where they do show some compassion for Palestine but it never really it never really wrestles with the question of settler colonialism yeah, um, added to my, my list I'll be watching <laughs> it later today and by the way did you Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Sorry, go no, ahead. I was, I was just going to conclude with like, and I think that's really what's the driving force behind the the um the campaign to get it take down by Zionists is because it's a palace. It's Palestinians telling their story, and the same way that the the, the flag is outlawed, yep. um, and certain texts are outlawed, it's, it's it's a way to sort of like um discontinue their history or yep. just allow for them to tell it. And a lot of the Nakba. If, if, like a lot of what we know about it has been through storytelling generation after generation after generation. What they want to do is end those voices so that those that can't continue. And I think um, like what Emil Carr Cabral says it about a people's culture defines them. And I think that if the people can't talk about their history and they can't talk about their past, then what people, what claim do they have to this, to their future? And I think that's really what this is about. To not allowing them to speak for themselves because I don't really think it's a question about it being a Palestinian story but more so who is telling this story about Palestine yeah well so and it's so funny you say that because one of the most popular pieces of international film on Netflix is a film that is a Romeo and Juliet story where a Palestinian and Israeli fall in love and that is like if you search Israel on Netflix, that's usually the first thing that comes up for most people's algorithm. So like they're totally fine with showing Palestinians when they can be docile, submissive, you know, uh, stay in their lane in a sense, falling in love with their own oppressors. Um, but this film, which was directed by uh, by this woman, it was a Palestinian woman who directed it. It's based on her own mother's life. So her mother watched her family be slaughtered by Zionist forces in 1948 and then had to live as a refugee in Syria. And so the director had her mother's story told to her by her mother's best friend, basically, and then recreated that story accurately in this film. And I, I, I need people to understand the larger context that's taking place. This World Cup 
mm. right now is literally some of the World Cup is worse PR for Israel than Israel literally shooting Palestinian children on camera. Mm -hmm. If you think about it and the fact that the largest sporting event in the world has turned into a large everyone laugh and ridicule and make fun of and refuse to do interviews yes. with anything related to Israel at all. So at the same time on December that that's happening, on December 1st, you have this film that accurately, so now the world is sympathizing with the Palestinian cause already. Yeah. So then you're like, well, let me show you this film that gives an accurate depiction of what even happened in 1948 to begin with. So right now, Israel is freaking the fuck out because they are in such a down bad period. I told you the World Cup was great. I and, love it. And and the only thing that the biggest problem was that yesterday, given that Senegal lost to England, unfortunately, uh, they kept repeating the phrase, I think happily, that they kept saying England has never lost to an African nation in the World Cup at a, at a knockout stage. They kept saying that over and over and over again. England has never lost to Africa. Has, it has never lost to Africa. It's never lost. And I was like, I was like keep saying it just keep reminding us just keep just keep just keep just keep going but i had not considered your point here dev about about uh qatar uh israel uh even everybody even everybody all the fans being encouraged to in their home country whatever where the the, the mm -hmm. yeah it's like uh, <laughs> yeah. and then on top of that but that was beautiful because we know they can't fly their flags freely um, in their homeland. So to see that, like, it, and especially, I think there's been so much criticism about like the Arab world in support of Palestine mm -hmm. or lack thereof. So to see that visually and optically um, in ways that we haven't seen that before, like people running across the field, as soon as they win their game, they pulling out the flag, like, you know, that big massive support um, for Palestine. But I also think that's also why Qatar is getting extra scrutiny, not because of the human rights violations or the workers' violations, because the U.S. doesn't care about none of that shit. I think or the bribery because, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Right, it's, we don't care about none of that shit. But no, no, no. I think it's really because of the situation what's happening with Israel. Like you would literally see people will be interviewing, giving interviews. And they say, "Well, where, what what paper are you from?" And they're like, "Israel." Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> and they walk away. Mm, and I talk yeah. to Israeli reporters. And so now Israeli is playing, they're now playing to that, you know, now they are the victim. Yep. The whole world is like, you know, the anti-Semitism. They're like playing into that now um, because nobody wants to actually take into account about the ongoing atrocities. I think they just, you know, shell bombed uh, Gaza yeah. last night. Um, so it's an uh. ongoing atrocity. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Let me, is there sound on this? It's like country well, country channel. You don't like us? Ch channel is this? Israel. Ch oh. Channel. You don't like us? Ch nice. Channel is this? Nice. Hey, shout Hello. out to Richard Medhurst. I, and I hope, with all due respect, I hope he has done, I haven't seen it. I hope he's done some coverage on Mumia and other stuff like he promised once upon a time. That's the, the, the one blind spot. That, that these mm -hmm. cats have as these political prisoners. But anyway, that's funny. And I like that. I like that little clip. I like there's, that. I that, didn't know. The, I didn't even know that. Yeah, the clip I sent you is a whole thread. And there's just yeah. been dozens upon dozens of in the middle of a live broadcast, them saying, Oh, we're an Israeli news station. The fan could be from Brazil, from Japan. From, from the UAE, wherever these people are from, they have all decided, fuck Israel. So yeah. Israel Israel is in a flop <laughs> era. Look at this. Oh, he's getting it. What is he? He's <laughs> not only Palestine. Can you imagine? No oh. <laughs> oh. Look at the walk off, though. That's pretty cool. Look at that face. <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's looking at his editor his producer like damn it who sent me over here you motherfucker you right <laughs> so in the middle of this this oh, Palestinian man, film great. comes out oh yeah this one's good too this one oh okay my bad my bad hi i was <laughs> this yes for israel what you no no yeah no, no. Okay. No, why 
Ah, be done. He pushed the mic away. Like, what you? No, no, yeah. no. Why? He said, no, get that out of my face. Oh, I love yeah. it. This is dope, man. Okay. I didn't even, honestly, I didn't know any of this was going on. Oh, yeah, it's been going on. It's so, massive, massive support. I mean, I, I, I do deeply support Morocco and, and their support for it, but it's also like, you know, free Western Sahara. <laughs> no question. No question. No question. Also, you no know. No question. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been, it's really miraculous to see like the the widespread support because I don't think I've ever seen it visually in this way mm -hmm, where people right. are like rejecting Israel. Well, and that's the thing is, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. So Israel probably is like activating so many state apparatuses right now to try and combat this negative PR that and, when and a he said the magic word, my bad. This one said the no, magic words though. Israel don't it doesn't exist. <laughs> oh my god! I like no, I like this one because all three of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's for, my bad. Sorry, Dev. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. You're good. You're funny. good. There's another one where the man literally physically pushes the Israeli away from him that <laughs> I laughed a lot at. Um, That's wow. But, you know, a film that gives an accurate... It's it's like what you always say, Jared, when we think of like Asada or Black Panthers and we're like, a film that accurately depicts any of that stuff will not be allowed to hit the mainstream airs. And in a, in a kind of way this film is similar for Palestinians. Like it's showing, it's from a Palestinian. It's showing an accurate depiction of the absolute brutality of Israeli settler colonialism and Zionism. And then in a response to this backlash that Israelis are doing against this film, Jordan decided to make this film its official submission for the Oscars this year. Oh, wow. So sure. now this film has officially <laughs> been submitted as their selection for the international category at the Oscars. So it should, I've just been trying to stay aware of what's happening and this story to Has me, more been done to reveal the Oscar process? Right? Like who's, who's, sorry about, go ahead, Ricky, sorry. No, I was gonna say she's Jordan, she's from Jordan, right? She's a uh, Palestinian from Jordan, so okay. Yeah. I'm like, wow, Jordan. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. So we're going to we're going to continue hearing about this film. And right now, the ADL and all of the Jewish, um, you know, Jewish Zionist organizations in the U.S. are claiming it's anti-Semitic and that the film portrays Israel in a negative light. And literally the exact same day this film hit Netflix video, sh there was video that came out showing that uh, Israeli occupation forces shooting a Palestinian in the face at point blank range. And I believe I could be wrong, but he was a it was a teenage it was a yeah. child, a teenage boy. So literally you're claiming this is so barbaric and that it doesn't show Israel in a good light. And on the exact same day, you're doing the thing that you're so mad about. It's, it, I don't know. Israel, I think in terms of PR and propaganda, um, they're entering into a flop era, <laughs> Palestinian resistance is armed and ready and is like has been ongoing now for several summers at this point israel is down bad and getting badder and more brazen hence why they have now turned to this strong right-wing coalition government they know they're down bad they know that people now can see exactly how violent they are so what do you do of course you turn to an even more uh dangerous version of fascism than what you've already been operating at. Can I just, uh, I just want to make a full circle thing too. We could also see one of the biggest supporters of the hashtag women like freedom is coming out of Israel. Israel has direct mm. issues with Iran. Iran provides material support, not these hashtag free Palestine um, <laughs> tweets. No, material support weaponries, you know, things that the, that they need um, to Palestine and has been for decades. One of the first <laughs> countries was Israel and it continues to be Israel um, to step inside and, and protect um, Iranian women, right? Because they And have that's why, oh my <laughs> God, the beauty of the Iranian USA game the other day, I was like, somebody called Cress Welsing from beyond the heavens 
because the, the the player they call they literally call Captain America literally also put his pelvic region on the line to get the goal needed to get past Iran. He literally put his balls on the line. I saw that. I saw his that. reproductive capacity, Cress Welsing would have been saying. He put his DNA <laughs> on the line to stop Iran. And he walked <laughs> and he hobbled off the field. And hobbled <laughs> off the field. Yeah. And then somebody literally, and then one of the announcers actually said he did a Willis Reed to, to come back on. Now, only people of a certain age might remember Willis Reed, the black New York oh, Nick, to come back onto the court after hurting himself just to make a, a symbolic, you know, heroic, I'm still here for you. So they gave Christian Pulisic all of that. I was just like, man, this is too perfect. Even as Iran went out, I was like, you know, come on, man. They, you know, you know, but Chris Welsing. <laughs> My mother's in the background saying, mm -hmm, yep, that man always used to say he was hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here like, shh, <laughs> No, it's facts. Pass the mic. Anyway. Um, listen, I appreciate the both of you very much. Uh, uh, let me give you any, any opportunity uh, for any concluding thoughts real quick. Um, uh, as, as we do have to, where well, I have to wrap up here. Yeah. Uh, dog has an appointment. There's other games to watch. The World Cup is on. And I do actually have a job in the margins of, of, of that, that R1 aspiring Morgan State <laughs> University. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> no, I just want to, um, I can wrap up with saying, you know, as always, thank you for inviting me and the opportunity to speak on this. Um, I have noticed that a lot of my work now is in this trajectory of trying not really so much exposing, but explaining these sort of social media phenomenons that happen. Um, because I think that people just get carried away and that sort of one-to-one -one thinking. I know here we understand cops to be a certain way under the capitalist system, and that's just getting superimposed onto these other systems and these other governments that don't function this way. And mm -hmm. without that sort of investigation and that understanding, a lot of these things get convoluted. A lot of these, um, you know, that's how color, color revolutions get pushed. Even if, 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 even if there's an organic grassroots movement of things happening, people need to really, really start to investigate because things being youth-led and woman-led and student-led does not make it necessarily revolutionary. Um, it does not mean that it doesn't have reactionary tendencies or is not serving um, empire. So I think that folks should really uh, keep that in mind. Um, be you know a little more critical about these Instagram posts. Um, a little more critical about these threads. Um, ask folks for footnotes. Ask for sources. Mm -hmm. um, investigate those sources because something coming from a newspaper does not mean that it's not. NED backed or USAID backed uh, because a lot of the reports on Iran was coming from Saudi backed papers and you know Saudi and Iran have conflict um, yeah. and Israel as well so and nobody should be offended if you ask them for a citation no okay I just want to <laughs> nobody they should be happy to share sources so right. please ask <laughs> so that's just really what I wanted to sort of get through to folks it's not really a matter because even like i said in the discussions in the chat it's really not a matter of um not your business mind your business but it is like <laughs> you have a role that you play specifically as a citizen or as a person living within empire and honestly nobody living in other countries cares about what you as an individual has to say about what's going on in their country they're concerned about what their citizens have to say and how far that can go and I think that if we understood the power that we hold or, or the positionality that we hold within Empire, that we would be less, um, there would be less of a drive to sort of take these hashtags on as a, as a form of solidarity. Um, there would be more of a, a, a material-based solidarity. Right on. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. hard to follow up. It's hard to follow up with that. I agree with everything Ricky said as per usual. Um, you know, I hope folks don't fall for the easy one, two swoop, left, right, left, right, uppercut, the Instagram carousel saying that Iran is mass executing 15,000 people on live stream for everyone to see or whatever they're saying, Viola Davis and Vic Mensa are sharing whatever info these black celebs are sharing, all these trending hashtags and all that. 
just look for the actual information. And if there are luminaries who you trust academically and politically, reach out to them, ask them how you, you know, for some readings. If you're in an organization, lean on your organization and trust the analysis of your organization to have the proper line on these different things. Um, and yeah, you can follow both me and Ricky on Patreon. Um, that's where I do all my writing and talking nowadays. We we have like some Discord shows me and Ricky do together that we're trying to get better at. Um, and you know, what'd you say? In the Cypher. Oh yeah, and we have a Patreon only podcast called The Cypher. We do once a month where we just take a random ass topic and just talk shit about it. What's the um, with Salifu, shout out comrade Salifu. And then as always, thank you BPM for having me. It's always a pleasure. Dr. Ball, I always appreciate your analysis. Um, please send the link to these to these Patreon. shows and to the Patreon right. again, please. Right. Um, so I can make sure that I'm not caught up. So I need to get caught up. And um, uh, yeah, no, and thanks to the both of you. You're always welcome here, obviously. And I appreciate the work uh, um, and Okay, right on. Thanks. Okay, I'll share that. I'll put that in the the, the link to that in the show description as well. Um, and any and any yeah, and to, to quote um, a rapper whose name I will not say, I have no ghostwriter. Anytime you hear Devin speak it, Devin wrote it. Um, and I think <laughs> I think quote. <laughs> everybody know who said that. <laughs> I just had to bring it back full circle and just make sure the chat reminded me. You know. When you hear Devin speak it or write it, it came from Devin's pen. And so, wait a minute, you know, I'm not getting it. Who said that? Then I'm it's all it. good. It's all good. <laughs> <Look. Hell yeah. laughs> it's all good. I'll explain later. <laughs> I'll explain later. I got you off camera. Here. I got. You. Um. Um. Okay. Good. 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 I appreciate it. Uh. Oh, real quick. I literally just got an email about this announcement. It will go live tomorrow morning. The social media announcement will go live in the morning with all your incredible videos. We hope that you'll help us uplift them. So for all the shit we've talked about, hashtags and social media, stay tuned to uh, BPMs and mine uh, because tomorrow that special announcement I've been talking about is finally going to go live. I can't wait. And I'm probably going to and, and make sure you have everything clicked here because I'm probably going to do a, uh, probably do a special pop up. I mix what I like for that joint because i'm very excited and oh oh the immaterial benefit from this is just <laughs> i can't wait so anyway dev ricky thank you both very much thanks to the remixers as well uh we know it stands for the it goes for the both of you and everybody in attendance who will see this later i'm sure peace to you both because we know you're willing to fight for it like fred hampton used to say special announcement coming tomorrow looking forward to it peace everybody see you later i mix what i like what i like what i like what i like what i like